line. Um, I think you have an amazing, I want to say conspiracy, but there's a lot to it that kind of leans toward, uh, I guess, truth. And, and you know, uh, there's a lot of backing to it. And I kind of want to, if you don't mind, I kind of want to start at the beginning. Hmm. There's two ideas here. One is that the Nephilim look like clowns, which is your uh, uh, original theory. Mm -hmm. And we also have the millennial reign situation, right? Yes. Um, yeah. yes. But I think I want to dive more into, just for the sake of time, stick with the Nephilim look like clowns. Okay. And um, if you don't mind, take us back to the beginning, all the way <laughs> to when <laughs> the earth started, uh, angels, watchers. Let's start there and kind of see if we could get people into understanding this idea. Yeah, sure. So um, it's hard to know where to begin with this. I've, I've done it thousands of times and it still never gets <laughs> any easier to, to uh, explain this. But um, I'm not sure what context your audience will be coming from, if they could understand some some basic things. So I, I guess I should probably just start with the basics at the beginning, just to give a good overview of what's going on here. Sure, sure. Uh, but I come from a, a, a world which is conspiratorial by nature. And uh, the, the, the kind of work I've been swimming in for over a decade is highly seeped in in esoteric uh, biblical strange mm -hmm. theologies and ideas and mysticisms and mythologies and um within that realm of research i have carved out for myself this this strange niche within the already strange niche of conspiracy which is um these things people talk about which are the nephilim which are right. ancient giants of of a pre-flood and post-flood world from a biblical uh, narrative um i have discovered that they would have had a, a very certain aesthetic about them which i've gone through on my uh, series on my channel to prove um through the artwork that's available and through the cult uh, the cultures around the world who still venerate these things in the forms of ancestor spirits they dress like them and right. what, what i've discovered is that these things actually had a very psychedelic terrifying look to them um, which involve very wide grins with sharp fang teeth, uh, like a serpent mouth that opens very wide, so a jester-like mouth, very big glowing eyes, um, wild red hair, extremely pale white, vampiric white skin. It's not like a, you know, a northern England white boy like me. I'm talking like, you know, white, white, like, right, right. like deathly white, white, you know, and uh, okay. it, yeah, exactly. Colgate White. So, but by that standard, you know, that is the base of a clown I've just described there, you know. And um, what I went on to discover after first getting onto this idea, after the after a lot of research and a lot of study and a, a few t hit, uh, tips and hints along the way, I kind of also discovered um, what we call a clown in the West is indeed our version of these same costumes worn by these ancient cultures around the world for the purpose mm. of channeling these spirits. There's this, there's this rule that's very well known among most of these ancestor spirit cult cultures and clown societies. They're actually called clown societies, funnily enough. That's why right. anthropologists have always named them. But they actually dress a certain way in order to be possessed by spirits. So they dress like the thing to be possessed by the thing. So it's a form of spirit communication. It's a, it's a, it's a standard tool, actually, in most shamanistic practices. To dress like something is to mirror something in the spirit realm to attract it towards you. And um, what the clown when is. When you say ancestor worship, this isn't yeah. like uh, uh, just a regional thing. This is everywhere. Yes. Every uh, society has some type of ancestor worship. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I could just, like, I have a personal antidote where I'm half uh, Ethiopian and half um, Caribbean, which is uh, St. Croix to be exact, the Virgin Islands. And uh, when I was a kid, about five years old or so, my dad took me. Uh, we went to the islands. We went there, and uh, you might have heard of it. They have carnival. Carnival mm -hmm. is a big thing. They have that in Brazil, uh, different Caribbean islands and stuff. And people dance. They put on costumes and all these type of things. And one of the things they have in the Virgin Islands is this uh, character that's on stilts. Yes. Uh, big long stilts. They dress up in wild colors and all these things, and they call them moko jumbi. Okay, mm -hmm. moko jumbi. 
And I remember during the festival, we're walking down the street. One of these things comes to me and I'm scared to death. <laughs> I remember screaming for my mom and just like, I don't want to be anywhere near this thing. And it was horrific to me. And I look at it now. OK, it's just silly. But when I think about it, where do these things come from? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, I, I post started postulating that uh, a while back. But coming across your videos, it really made me think all these things they derive from these places. They they do uh -huh. derive from a place of worshiping something else uh -huh. that we, we may think is one thing now. You may think it's ancestors, but it seems to, you know, unless we have 12 foot ancestors, <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> so, but continue. So no, absolutely. And what, what you're discussing there, um, you know, in the Caribbean, you have these ideas of carnival, which are kind of European cultures and Christian ideas of fasting periods and a party before a fast. A lot of Italian carnival is quite a famous one as well with the Venetian masks. So yeah. what you get in the Caribbean, there's like a mix between this European influence mm -hmm. with with African ancestor spirit worship cultures as well. And there's many countries in Africa all with their own flavor of this. So don't get me wrong, but there's there's different ways they all kind of do this. Um, but right. the stilts is actually very common in Africa, and especially in the I think the Dogon uh, cultures of Africa, yep. which are a very isolated um, tribe that kind of got dominated by Islam, I believe, in Africa. Mm -hmm. But this, they still remained with their ancient culture, and they kind of, I think, it's because they were in such an obscure place in Africa, which was hard to invade. That they kind of, you can right. still see an example of this very old belief system. And walking on stilts is a part of their ancestor spirit worship dances and rituals, which actually yeah. go on for months the specific rituals and yes they were bright pink flailing colored things a lot like the carnival people wear with the feathered dresses and everything like yeah. that in like brazil yeah. for example as well as another famous example in rio um so yeah the, these are you more think the twerking's a part of it what's that sorry a part you think twerking is part of ancestor <laughs> worship oh my god maybe everywhere. maybe okay. you know who knows where these things come <laughs> from but uh you know the ritualistic dance of any kind uh, seems to have its roots in a very very tribal form of uh, veneration of something bigger than themselves but like i said when i say ancestors and as you were explaining they're alluding to these are not your aunties and uncles i'm talking right. about here that's just our english word we have to describe what they're talking about and we use this word ancestor which to us as english-speaking people has certain connotations we think that means our lineages of our own bloodlines going back just a few centuries but to these people what they mean by their version of the word ancestor is not um lineages of humans they mean very ancient basic beginning creator gods who made their civilization and cultures they're talking about the builders and the foundations of their belief that's who they're going right. to they're going back to these spirits guides and gods of some kind and it's usually transactional in a lot of these cultures who do dress this way and use it as a tool they get something from it so they allow the thing in they offer it a sacrifice usually eating or drinking something specific of um Haitian Vodou is a great example of this. Um, and that's a strange blend, again, of uh, African ancestor spirit worship and the, the Gide Pantheons. Papa Legba comes from an African uh, specific tribe as well. And uh, it's kind of mashed, to yeah, it's smashed together with Freemasonic um, symbolism. Uh, you, the sigils they draw are all Freemasonic with a square and compass, and, and they dress like a Freemason Grand Worshipful Master with the top hat and the cane. Uh, but it also has that strange blend of Catholic I, um, icon worship mixed in with it as well. So it's like a blend of three odd uh, belief systems all slapped together into this Haitian voodoo, they called it, which is then spread out into certain parts of America as voodoo, you know. But voodoo is the basic form. But that's what they do. They. Uh, they dress like Papa Legba with the white face makeup and the top hats and um, this you know, and then basically once they've been taking it in and take the spirit of this this god within them, they drink rum and smoke cigars because that's what the god wants. It's not because they enjoy doing it themselves. And they even claim you know, they black out. They don't remember doing anything. The the, the spirit's got them. And it's, it's using it's because the spirit is living through them. It's, yeah. It's completely taking over their body exactly and it's in their senses it's using their fingers their taste buds their ears their nose their eyes to experience the world because these entities which we call demons don't have bodies and this is where i can get into the history of the nephilim now and where we can go on to get into these cultures so on cool. so so the nephilim are it's a word based in two root word, root words which is nephil and the fall in paleo hebrew so nephil and the fall basically translates to um so the fall is to fall in any capacity it can mean a tree feller or a feller or falling over or fallen in nature of some kind any any 
any way of applying the word fall in any capacity, nefal can fit into that mm-hmm. spot. Mm-hmm. And so that's one root word where we get nephilim from, nephal. Uh, and mm-hmm. then there's nephil as well, which literally means tyrannical giant ruler. The, okay. That's literally what it means. So slap those two words together, you get nephilim, which is the plural word for tyrannical giant rulers of a fallen type nature. So that's nephilim as as a, mm. as a descriptor so it's described in the book of genesis as there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that after the sons of god came into the daughters of men and bore offspring the same men became heroes of old mighty men men of renown um, and then it kind of skips on from then and starts going on to talk about noah <laughs> and the flood um right. and it, it's it's odd it kind of just kind of breezes past this thing in genesis right. and it's just one paragraph you kind of get explaining that something weird happened and giants were created that were venerated as gods for a season and then he goes on to explain the flood and there's a link there and and i think michael heiser explained it as if it if it stands out and it's odd it's probably important okay so we should look mm-hmm. into that more right. and uh, the only kind of things we can find that expound upon this are extra canonical books uh, so the mm-hmm. book of Enoch is where we have to go to find the story Genesis 6 is referring to. Because uh, it's kind of written Genesis and the whole um, Torah, the early te- uh, Old Testament, that, that big thick book that we call the Old Testament, yeah. is a very specific story that's trying to specifically tell the story of um, a, partic- a particular bloodline. So it's all about dates and names and when they right. were born and who, bega- yeah, who begat who and, and whose son was who and who created what right. nations. It's, it's like a list of lineages and then rules when it gets down to Moses. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like a God forming a peoples for himself to call his own in order to bring himself into the world. And it's all precursors to the New Testament, which is the Savior, which is the coming of Jesus Christ. That's all right. kind of what right. it's leading to, to save Adam, the promise to Adam that he will redeem him for, from his fallen state because... He is, there's a war going on. So we talk about the rebellion of the angels. Okay, everyone knows about the fall of Lucifer. This seemed to happen around the same time these giants ended up being created. And when uh, Adam got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and it seems like there's this long period of time before the flood where everything just got really, really, really messed up on the, on the earth. And we're like talking the worst possible time to ever be alive. We think we have it bad now. This is, this is worlds apart from <laughs> how bad things can actually get if we allow them to. And this is obviously what caused... We're talking like Lord of the Rings type of stuff that was that, well, yeah. that's going on back then, essentially. We're talking like flesh-eating, giant monster chimera, oh, hybrid Lord. snake being thing just tearing people apart and drinking the blood and sacrificing the children and just just monstrous horrible things genetic engineering the mixing and blending of flesh to create monsters it was just chaos absolute chaos i've been to frat parties that are worse bro. <laughs> oh yeah maybe and maybe <laughs> but uh, this was one long frat party let's put it that way that that um had no hope of 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 ending until god's mercy was given to us and noah was set apart as the only person left uncorrupted basically he's described as being perfect in his generations that's not not just being a really good guy who kept all the laws it is that it's also he's uncorrupted he hasn't messed with his dna he's still human Mm -hmm. as god intended from adam okay but everyone else that's not what is explained in these other books, which are outside of the main canon, but extra canonical. We call them more pseudepigraphical or apocryphal. Right. Many names you can give these books, but the Book of Enoch is actually still a part of the uh, the canon of Ethiop- Ethiopian of the Bible. of the Ethiopian Bible. Yeah, which is so we can take it as, and it is actually referenced quite a few times in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It does seem like the Book of Enoch is well known even to the apostles and to the people who were writing these other books. You know, it it was correct like correct me if I'm wrong. Was that the was that found in the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls? Was that a yes. part of the Dead Sea Scrolls? It was discovered okay. in, I think, 47, 1947, I think it was, around that okay. time. Um, funnily enough, around the same time period, Israel was being established as a nation. So there's a lot of stuff go around the discovery of this, which is quite odd. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not saying I trust that the new nation of Israel is necessarily the real people of god which is described in the torah it's, it, there's a load i'm a conspiracy theorist so i can go on for hours about that but we're not going to get into that today okay but yes it was red heifers today yeah. it may yeah, none of that today but it was actually uh, discovered in the Qumran caves in the same region with the dead sea scrolls and many other books as well and it was kind of a part of a collection that was discovered um yes. 
And But when you actually read it and read all the translations, it does give a lot of insight into that Genesis 6 verse about sons of God coming down and taking wives of human women and creating giants. So it, it right. basically just tells you that story of how that happened. And as it's described, is there was, a, there, was this, there was this group of angels called the Watchers. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of explained that they kind of, they chose to come to earth, a lot of them with good intentions, to watch over humanity and make sure they stay righteous and understand God and stay connected to the way he wants them to live. But the leader, Sam Yaza and Azazel, there's arguments whether they're the same angel, just by a different name, or they're two separate angels, but are both corrupted and working together as leaders of these 200 angels that came down to Mount Hermon. Um, it seems like... Sam Yaza was fully on board when he came down to completely mess everything up. He was in rebellion. And don't forget, Lucifer was also in rebellion against God at this time. Uh, Satan, many names you can go by. Beelzebub is another name. But either way... So he... it, it, it's never that Sam Yaza gets confused with Lucifer either? Uh, I've always thought that maybe they could have been one in the same. A lot of people, yeah, it, it's blurry. It's very blurry. It really is. Either way, uh, they can make the ultimate Marvel villain. I'll tell you that right now. That, that yeah, yeah. Yaza sounds crazy. I think, I think it's either Sam Yaza or Azazel, which translates to he who hangs on Orion's belt or something. It's really odd. Like, But angels are often associated with stars as well. Right. And even Beelzebub is associated with Venus. And so is Lucifer, the, the, the bright and shining morning star, which is Venus, the brightest star in the sky next to the sun and the moon. Obviously, it's the third brightest body. So people mm. obviously equate. Um, angels with stars you can get you can get into the semantics of all that and the details but the story goes that the leader of these watchers came down and convinced the rest to take wives of the beautiful humans that were around of the women they they, they kind of came down in the flesh to teach humanity righteousness but then succumbed to the the pleasures of the flesh basically they got corrupted themselves in a way and they gave in to those urges that otherwise angels wouldn't have but I think it's by a nature of coming down to the earth and living with us, it gets to you, it gets into you, you know, and you can't live embodied without having to suffer what we humans have to suffer all the time, which is lust and pride and envy and greed and all the rest of the emotions that come with just being in a body in, in general, in a, such a dense physical sense. Um, but it seems like they did. They took wives and uh, they gave in to their urges and these wives gave them children, which were... Nephilim, half human, half angel hybrids. Now, this is, by the way, this is massively contested by most churches. Like, mm -hmm. they will not entertain this idea. The most common mainstream view is that um, the sons of God described in Genesis 6 are just really good humans from the lineage of Seth. And they mated with uh, the daughters of men, which were the bad human lineages from the bad side of Cain. And the good people having sex with the bad people somehow created giants. But that was just a metaphoric way of describing mighty men who were just really famous. Okay. Right. Now, okay. I think that's a cop out because sons of God is applied everywhere else in the Bible to describe specifically the angels. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just, just in that one verse, we're just going to say it's not the case. It's just outrageous. And um, as far as I'm aware, two humans having sex with each other does not create giants in any sense. And, um, Except for Shaq, <laughs> but yeah. Well, yeah, well, that, well, it depends what you <laughs> want to define as giant. But yeah, these, right. these things were like 50 foot tall, mm -hmm. 100 foot tall. The, these things got way out of hand. Right. And in, in the Book of Enoch, it just says, you know, that these, these, these giants were worshipped as gods originally, as mighty mm -hmm. men, as something else, because they were just divine. They, they were half angel, half human. That's nuts. You know, these things were glowing. They looked they looked insane. They were powerful. They had powers, you know, beyond, way beyond the human comprehension. And they kept growing, is what we're, just, what we're told. And it says humanity could no longer sustain them because they just kept eating and eating everything, all the grain, everything, all the stores of food they had. And it says eventually they turned against the humans and started eating each other and the people. So it just got way out of hand. It just got bloody and messy and the cults were created to venerate these things. And they were worshipped as gods, demigods, and they very quickly got themselves into positions of rulership over all of humanity as the kings as well. And it seems like this was the plan all along from the angels that did this, or at least Sam Yaza convincing the angels to do this. Because it, it, at the same time, there was a human rebellion happening as well as this angelic rebellion. Cain was in rebellion against God. So Cain, after Adam and Eve were 
tempted by the serpent, as it's described, you know, and, and tricked into partaking of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, whatever, whatever that means, you know, but they were kind of, they got the raw end of the deal and they end up being tricked into believing that there was more for them if they were to do this thing that God told them not to do, not realising they already had everything that God could possibly give them. They walked with him and talked with him in the Garden of Eden. What more do you want, you know? But they kind of were convinced there is more, but they ended up in a lesser state as a result of it and banished from the Garden. Um, and he says, you know, she bore Cain, had a son called Cain, and then had Seth. Those two brothers loggerheads Cain jealous of uh, Seth and God um, taking his sacrifice over his so Cain kills um, Abel sorry Abel and then obviously yeah. they mourn banish uh, Cain out and it says then this is where you get you get another one of these odd little descriptions that doesn't really get expounded upon and you're supposed to just jump in time yeah, yeah you're supposed to just take it for, for its word but it says Cain went to the land of Nod which is an, clearly an established place with a name who named it, if Adam and Eve are the only two people and there's no other humans about. Uh, he says he took a wife. From who did he take a wife, <laughs> exactly? Right. Uh, and then he had, had his first son called Enoch, and he named, he built a city. So who built the city? Because you need manpower to build cities. Who populated the city? Because cities aren't just made for one person. Um, and then it's he named that city Enoch. And it seems like from then on, Cain was in this mode of being a city builder. He expansionist. He he expanded his power by dominating the land, destroying the, the area and conforming it to his shape and will. So he had some knowledge. This, this guy could build cities. He understood geometry perfectly, how to work architecture, because his father, Adam, walked with God and probably knew a thing or two. And this is how it's described in most researchers' work as the seven sacred sciences. Adam was taught a lot of knowledge from God about how the universe works, and he taught that to his children, and they to carry on to their children's children. But because mm -hmm. of this split of rebellion and jealousy and pride and anger against God, because, like, you've rejected me, you've banished me out into the world, uh, you put a mark on me so no one will kill me, and he essentially made him, like, an immortal god who had to suffer for <laughs> like, uh, yeah, alone, yeah. and people would know you killed your brother type of thing in a world full of people who would murder him. Um, it's like, who was he scared he of? like a vampire. He yeah, a vampire. And he became, like, it became something. We, it's, there's a lot of it books that kind of theorize on what the mark was exactly but he said to god don't send me out there they're going to kill me you can't do this and god said no they won't because i'm going to put a mark on you and this mark will tell anybody if they touch you the punishment on them will be seven times worse okay so it's kind of he marked them so no one to, to honor his wish that no one would kill him you know right, but right. who was he scared of exactly because we're, we're told is only adam and eve and there's and again this is another extremely contentious thing i'm about to say here but there is mm -hmm. a lot of precedence when you actually get into the conspiratorial side and get out of the church dogma you know the 501c3 dogma and actually go out there and read these books for yourself and and study it's possible there was people around before adam and eve god created man and woman plural and said to them go out be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth and man and woman did go off and do that so he probably created many men and women and they all populated the earth and took over. And then he goes on to say, God created Adam and then put Adam in a garden. That's a different story. Completely he different story. He placed them there, right? Basically, yeah. Like made him there. He placed them there. It, it seems like he, after making all of mankind, he goes on to the next chapter and says, then he made Adam. And then he, right. it's like Adam was set apart. And it's like, basically, he said, I, I made him in my image to teach him everything so he could be the king over the mm -hmm. earth that he's created for his creation, which is humanity. Now, this is where the rebellion comes in from the angels. The angels didn't like this. They did not like what they saw because the angels were like a serpentine class, animalistic type race that were all kind of separate from humans. And clearly so. They were made in God's image. The angels weren't. So I think they were getting jealous. I think they started to actually literally get jealous of Adam because Adam was given the honor of naming all the animals. The angels have been there since the beginning of creation before man. Why does why does this thing get to name the animals? Why don't we? You know, it's and I think that's where the the jealousy and pride began to ferment, at least in Lucifer's heart, in Satan's heart, because um, he was seen as as like God's most beloved, closest angel, and he was getting jealous of of Adam basically. 
And there's a lot of speculation here too, but it does seem like it's possible the serpent in the garden isn't Satan. It was actually a race of serpentine humanoid people who were also walking around at the same time, even in the Garden of Eden. And that's why the Satan, that's why the serpent could just easily approach Eve and she had no beef about it or was, wasn't freaked out because she's probably talked to these things thousands of times and lived with them for God knows how long. We don't even know how long they were in the garden before, before they got cast out. It could have been lifetimes, you know. But it, right. seems, it seems odd that this talking snake thing as we're described as serpent comes up to her and starts saying oh did god say you couldn't have from that tree no no i think he was having you on he's only saying that because he knows if if you do take that you'll be like him and he doesn't want you to be like he wants to keep you down you know he wants to keep you stupid he wants to be not like a god your eyes will be opened if you eat and you'll know more that he doesn't want you to know you know and she was listening it's like why why wouldn't she trust why would she have any reason to doubt this thing and i think from what i've deducted is this is an enemy of my enemy is my friend situation I think the seraphim dragon class angels who are closest to God, who sit, go around his throne singing, holy, holy, holy. You know, these are the ones that are right next to God's ear. Um, well, seraphim literally means fiery flying serpents. These are dragons. These are fire breathing giant, think China style dragons on temples. These are, these are the gods. These are the angels, you know. And I think and they for anybody of my audience that thinks like angels, because we're, we're always given since we're kids that angels are these sweet, either baby mm. creatures, the cherubs that are flying with little wings or these beautiful, you know, uh, uh, Giselle bunching looking <laughs> angels, you know. But if you type in real angels or the description that the Bible gives you and other uh, biblical texts give you, you would see the wildest thing. Mm -hmm. You would see, I mean, these wheels with eyes on it and shining brightly. And, mm -hmm. and, and when you think about it, a lot of people talk about, you know, that even what you're saying now with the, uh, these Nephilim being very, the fractal patterns and all this, it's very trippy. They're, they're trippy. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? The, the, the divine, it's very possible that the divine is trippy in nature. Like it's kind of like, a, it's very surreal and the creatures that come from that from god that he created are more fantastical than we can even imagine so oh yeah um, well the, well the live ezekiel's vision is the best example we have of of a glimpse into the thrones of god and heaven and literally the, the thrones are a type of angel you know and they have right. like and and you have these these things with huge wings that hold up the firmaments that are literally a part of creation they are the pillars of the foundation of our world and our universe you know and right. ang angels have an intricate relationship with creation itself. They're like the cogs that make it happen. They don't mm -hmm. make they aren't they aren't the creators of reality, but they're like a piece of the machinery of reality. Uh, angels play a role, Every and it gives credence to this new age concept that everything is alive. Literally, everything has a consciousness. Like they are, it ma it's made up of these beings we call angels. You know, and they all have different roles in the hierarchy, and some of them are more free to do what they want. But like the ones that hold up the the firmament, they can't move. They're, they're there forever. You know. And then you have the chariots with the wheels, like I said, wheels within wheels, just surrounded with eyes. Then you have the living creatures, which have like four heads of different animals, and just just right. wild anamorphic creations of different experimental forms and types you know and they can shape shift and manifest on, on the earth through things called oikotarians in any form they want they're both physical and spiritual at the same time it's like a sleeve to them they can jump in and out of it this is where you get hindu why... oh i'm sorry to cut you off go ahead. i'm just this is where you get the idea of like hindu avatars is a great way of showing this you know like you have the right. three main gods which then manifest in different avatars as many variety of gods below them and it's kind of this is angel play, you know, and angels, like I said, the seraphim seem to be like a specific class of angel who were closest to God, who were dragons, basically. That's their form, you know, the, and yeah. even China's rife with dragon mythology being involved with working with the Jade Emperor, who is yeah. their analogy for God, you know, and they're like water elements and fire elements and they're like involved with certain parts of creation like the sea or the volcanoes or something like and they're kind of stuck there and this famous story of in of the jade emperor where um the people were dying of drought and they were calling up for help and the jade mm -hmm. emperor was ignoring them so the dragons left the places where they should be to go to the jade emperor to ask for help for the people can you bring them rain you know and the jade emperor was distracted but it, by music or something like that and he said, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll sort it out. Go, go, go. You're fine. You're fine. Just go. I'll sort it out. You know, and the, but his, the first thing he said was, why have you left your estate? 
why you why you why are you not where I said you should be? You know, he seems pretty pissed off that the dragons have left the sea, for example. These are water dragons, you know. Right. It's like, why aren't you in the sea making sure the sea works? <laughs> like, like, why aren't you being the cog in the machine I designed? Type of, that's what he's saying, basically. But he says, go back. I'll bring rain to the people. Don't worry about it. But then months pass and nothing comes. So the dragons go back to the Jade Emperor and see that he's still distracted. So they say to each other, let's give rain to the people ourselves. You know, let's just do it ourselves. We're water dragons. So they do give people the rain. Jade Emperor finds out, is furious, and long story short, he traps all the dragons underneath four mountains, and then the rivers come out from those mountains, and they're the rivers of China today, whatever. But these analogous stories we're getting are talking about dragons being the servants of God you know in a way and it, these these stories are kind of everywhere dragons are all over the earth and every continent and this is what we're talking about here we're talking about seraphim angels and i do believe they as being the closest to god they were the, they were the watchers they were the ones that were entrusted by god to come down and look after his creation man and they're the ones who messed up severely and corrupted it even more but i do think this rebellion was happening cain on one side Rebelling against God, wanting to just destroy his creation, subdue the people that were already there, dominate, destroy the, the earth, the forests, build cities, you know what I mean? Which is quite a domineering, industrious way of thinking. It's described in other books that he introduced weights and measures to the people. That's insane. To us, it seems simple. But mm -hmm. to these agrarian people who had no concept of borders or property rights, weights and measures give sense, a sense of ownership which then leads to possessiveness, which then leads to other problems like, you know, greed. <laughs> like, and it's just one thing after another. But Cain was out there just doing all this while Seth's lineage would be an agrarian, one with the land, nature-loving type people, vegetarians, you know, and all, all the rest of it. But this mark of Cain as well, which he was given, people have argued, oh, well, the mark of Cain is like black skin or something. It's been justified throughout the centuries for all sorts of racist nonsense on all sides, everywhere, you know. And as people are always arguing today, like, who's the true, line of Seth and who's the true line of Cain or who are the real Israelites or whatever and it's just stupid semantics because Christ came to end all that kind of stuff it doesn't matter anymore it's it, you, we're all equal under God through Christ that's that's the good news you know but the point the point is the mark of Cain might not be black skin as people have predominantly seem to always believed um mm. it's actually white skin but not like me not like anything human we're talking like uh -oh. <laughs> like like a vampire and it's described as leprous white and leprosy gets like chalky flaky mm -hmm. dead white skin it's really horrible to look at they, they look like corpses you know and that's mm -hmm. kind of the mark that it seems Cain would have had if not um all over the body at least the face had this white thing going on and i do believe again the enemy of my enemy is my friend so not only did the seraphim angels come to the serpent in the garden because they are also dragons, and it came to the serpent humanoid form first. Basically said to the serpent, why didn't God choose you to be the king over the earth? You're more superior than the mammals. You're the serpentine race, you know. Like us, we're way superior to these mammal, monkey, primate type race that God chose. So probably stoked jealousy in the serpent race which then went on to attack the human race and convince them to eat the apple so that happened then once they were kicked out i think then the angels in rebellion went to cain and said look at god he's kicked you out let's team up and keep working together to destroy his creation even further and then cain offered up his daughters to have sex with the angels who had just come down seven generations from that town because <laughs> they lived for a long time by the way these people lived for like nine hundred a thousand years so they were around to see their grandchildren's 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 grandchildren just raised up you know so the daughters of cain are the ones who mixed with the watchers which are the dragons so the daughters of cain with chalk white skin that was the first generation <laughs> That first. was the first generation of Cain, Cain's daughters and the, the angels. Yes, but Go this on. all happened in the sixth generation from Seth in the time of Jared. Okay, so okay. there was a uh, there was a, a six generations from Seth where it was just Cain doing his thing, dominating, building up, and these and became a warring, powerful nation. And it, it goes on to say, you know, how like a lot of like Lamech and Tubal Cain were like master artifacts of building weaponry and things like this. They were a warring people. They were a dominating people, you know, Seth's lineage, not so much. They were more peace, keeping the peace, keeping their distance, separating themselves from things, being one with the land. It was a completely different, just two different paradigms, yeah. you know, but it seems like the angels in rebellion sided with Cain and Cain eventually, by the time of Lamech, offered up his daughters to 
you know, the angels in rebellion who came down to Mount Hermon. And what's odd is described that Semyaza, the leader of the Watchers, before they all descended, he went down to prepare the way. What does that even mean? What do you mean, prepare the way? <laughs> like, and, and I've looked into it, and it seems like he went down to talk to Cain to say, I'm coming down with, with, with the guy soon, okay? Get, you, get your daughters ready and prepared. Doll them up, whatever you're going to do. You know? And when I come we down... With, make up. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah you know, we've taught you all these things. You know, Once we come down, get them ready to come up. And also, have you built the cities yet? And it's kind of saying, it says these cities are being built in preparation for what's to come, which are the giants. Okay, mm. It seems like he's prepared everything. Like, the rebellion's in full swing. The plan's in motion. I've convinced the guys to come down. They think they're coming down to help everybody, you know. And but I'm here, you know, to convince them to have sex with these women that you've got prepared, right, Kane? You know, you built all the cities ready to populate with these giants. We're going to make, and it's. I think that's what he did. And then he went back up and said, "Yeah, guys, everything's cool. Come down." And that's where the temptation happened, and that's where the corruption began, and that's when giants started to just fill the place. And it only took about four generations before Noah before everything was just destroyed. There was nothing left after this. About 400 years after that. Yeah, so. something like that. But the punishment, funnily enough, the punishment for these um, watchers who did this happened way before the flood, about 200 years before the flood even came. And, and they, they yeah, they, well, they had to watch their beloved ones kill each other. And that's mm. the giants. They had to watch their own children war with one another over petty power squabbles because the Nephilim weren't that smart. They were like mm. prideful, stupid, giant brutes. But the parents, you know, the angels, were there since the beginning of time. They, were, they had the intelligence. They were kind of just using the brute power of their children to dominate God's creation, you know, from like a hidden hand perspective as the pantheons of gods that people had started to worship during this time. They were posing as gods, making people forget about the one God and his creation, and making people worship the creation instead. So you get sun worship cults appearing, planet worship cults, you know, earth worship cults, um, dragon worship cults, uh, pantheons theons of gods worshipping cults appearing anything to distract people away from one god and his creation so by the time it got to that point god said okay i've had enough you're gonna have to watch your kids kill each other now they are not going to continue so the first og nephilim the really big ones the titans they they died by just murdering one another but they had children too they had the nephil and the elio and um the Eliud as well is described in the book of Jasher, I think it is, in the book of Jubilees and Enoch. But these were like quarter angel humans. So the half angel humans raped women. Those women gave birth. So you had like a quarter angel human. And then they raped women. They had offspring. They had like an eighth angel human <laughs> hybrid. So they, right, get, they right. get smaller and smaller with each generation coming closer to the flood. I don't think they killed each other off. It only says you, ha you have to watch your beloved ones, which your children immediately die. So they were still around. There was still corruption on the earth, but the big giants were dead. And it's these big giants, which were the closest things to looking like a clown. The, the first original ones because if you have pale white skinned human women which is the clown thing the base of a mm -hmm. clown mixing with glowing fiery serpentine beings when that comes together it doesn't look like a human it looks like a serpent human hybrid and it looks right. like a white skinned big wide grinning mouth bulges bulging eyed elongated pointy features wild red glowing haired clown monster covered in serpent patterns all over the skin because reptiles are very colorful creatures when you actually look at them they're very psychedelic to look at one of the most colorful palettes in all of nature next to fish and insects you know these things are psychedelic to look at a chameleon for example can literally change the colors on its skin it's nuts okay <laughs> but i think yeah. the dragons mixing with humans gave humans humans this psychedelic look to them they were insane to look at fearsome monsters you know they weren't just these conan the barbarian huge pectoral muscling, muscle looking brown long-haired things with wearing a loincloth which is what most people draw them as they right. were monstrous beings and you can find depictions of them everywhere on the earth when you actually go looking and uh, the most closest one i found which seems to be the truest to it is the gorgon of greece and the Rakshasas of India, specifically. But you find this pattern everywhere. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'll get this stream back on in a minute. It's just uh, the way Zoom works. It times out after half an hour, but we will, uh, we will get back on. Let me just see if I can call him back. I 
I assume when it comes to his stream, uh, none of this will happen. He'll he would have sliced it all up. Um, leave that meeting. In the meantime, guys, while I'm waiting for this to be sorted out, just an announcement to those who have ordered the Nephilim Look Like Clowns book. Um, I will actually need your uh, shipping address and your choice of either volume one in a few months time signed and sent to you or if you want to wait a year you can get both volumes combined together into one book and signed and sent to you so i'll if you uh, i think they have about 17 or 16 of you who haven't made a choice yet out of 80 so it's going well most of you have told me what you want uh, but for those few remaining people, if you are listening, please send me an email to understandingconspiracy at gmail.com and uh, let me know what your preferences are. Do you want book one signed and sent to you in a few months uh, or do you want to wait a year and get both combined volumes signed and sent to you instead? It's your choice completely. If you, if you donated £100 or more, you can choose one or the other and I'll honour I'll honor whatever you choose to do. That's fine by me. Um, but of course, I don't think I think the host might have to make a new meeting here. So if you just bear with me, guys, I put a quick slideshow on of let's let's put some let's put some clowns on in the background while I figure this out. OK, hey, you might have to send me a new email to start with a new meeting. That's all. So we'll get that sorted. Um, But yeah, guys, it's actually going quite well with the book. Um, I am just about to write the conclusion now, and then I'm going to spend a month and a half just doing a full proofread. Um, I've got all the software necessary to do this, so I can give it a proper thorough run through, get it all up to scratch. I've actually almost finished the book cover as well, which I'm quite excited about. Um, so I've got all the concepts for that pretty much down. And it's, those are things I can't do until literally the last minute, because I need to know exactly how thick the book's going to be in order to produce the correct image so I know how thick the spine's going to be for print. So it's kind of these last minute touches I'm not going to be able to finalise until the book's just about to be published, but I do have everything pretty much prepped and ready to go. And so it's all very exciting stuff, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I do just need... I need this guy to figure out what he's... Got. Okay, I think he's just sent me a new message. And he's sending me a new link now. So we'll get back on track with the Nephilim Clowns talk. This gives me a chance, however, to just have a quick drink, which uh, I do need. I've got my tea on the side. Yeah, because I, I, I uh, tend to intermittently fast after like 6 p.m., 5 p.m. most evenings. And I found that herbal tea is the best way to still be able to keep the fast going and have something with a hint of flavor. But it's got to be things like chamomile tea or low low sugar tea as a way to like not break the fast and everything, but this is the best way I can find it. And I'm mainly doing it for weight reasons. I'm trying to lose some weight before I go on holiday. <laughs> so that's the aim. Um, and then to be fair, you know, uh, in, in the past two months or a month, I have lost a stone and a little bit. Uh, so it's going the right direction, but not as fast as I would have would have hoped. Let me check here. I think you may have just sent me a link. I think that was that, that's what that was. Just refresh. Not quite there yet. How we how are guys doing in the chat? Um, is it completely closed? Can I not buy it? Um, yeah. Well, like I said, the book will be for sale um, in a couple of months on Amazon. So give it time. Um, but the book will be for sale soon enough. Um, and that may maybe a week before it's published. Now, if everything is set, there's just one thing I need to clear before I can officially publish it, which is the copyright. And the trademark and all these type of things um there'll be a date i have a date kind of set for that um roughly but i need to just check a few things um with on the legal side of things but if i have everything prepped and ready to go before that date officially i will just put it up for pre-order or something and i, I can you can pre-order it before it gets officially released like a week maybe i'll do something like that but we'll see how it goes i mean there's no need necessarily 
You want me to turn up the guest? Okay, I'll turn the guest up there. Uh, Wendy, thanks for letting me know. I've turned his volume up to the max. Uh, originally, when I came on, he was spiking really loud, but I think he may have gone away from his mic since then. Yeah, so... Um... Quick carbs and sugar, you will drop it fast. I lost 10 pounds in a week. Yeah, well, I actually... Um... I did go on a full sugar fast for like a month, um, and I broke it a little bit recently, I'm not going to lie, Easter kind of got the better of me because there's just been chocolate everywhere. I don't have heart anywhere near as much as I used to have, though I will say that much, um, but I have um, yeah, have been uh, heavily fasting more so. I did a 24-hour fast a couple of days ago as well, and I always do a, a, at least an 18-hour fast every day. Um, I just find it works best for me anyway. I don't deal well with eating in the evening. My body doesn't seem to be able to process it very well overnight. And I always wake up with like severe pain in the stomach and things. I think my hemochromatosis might have something to do with that. I'm not 100% sure. But I've always found I feel best when I fast and stop eating um, after 6pm. Um, and then don't eat again until about midday. That seems to be my, my best way of doing it. <laughs> Stop eating. I lost sixty pounds after my divorce. <laughs> this is not him. Yeah, you know, you don't get me wrong. It there's, there's something to be said for a proper, full, long, prolonged fast as well. Um, it's it's good for the soul as well. You do it, it does feel like a good reset after a good fast, doesn't it? I'm not gonna lie. Uh, Brenda Lukens, welcome to membership. Thanks for joining. I'm just scrolling back on the chat here, trying to see what I can find. Vibes, thanks for being here. Thanks to my trusty mods for being around. I really appreciate you guys. I really do. I need to find some way of paying it forward. And I'm not sure what the best way to do that is, but I'll I'll, I'll figure something out. Um, Let me just check my emails. I think something may have come through. Yep, yeah, we've got a new link. We've got a new link. Let's see what I can do here. We'll leave that meeting open in Zoom US. Join. And there we go. Are we back? Okay, there we go. Are we good? <laughs> Apologies. It's okay. Uh, all right. So we were talking about the raptures from uh, India and these different other countries. Um, yeah. So, so the the best examples I have found of human hybrid creatures uh, with these dragons seem to be shown in Greek uh, mythos and within the Rakshas mythos of Hindu of, of Hin India as well. Recording in progress. Uh, which is Hindu mythology, which actually spreads across a lot of islands in that Indic region, you know, that oceanic region, um, right. all, the, all the way across to Bali. And then if you go across to Papua New Guinea, it starts to blend out into more ancient cultural um, icon iconography worship. Then you get to uh, into Australia and you find the Ind Indian influence kind of dissipates. But even they in Australia have their own version, which is called the Wangina, which quite literally looks like a white-faced, huge, red, puffy-haired clown with a mm. frill and polka dot costume and everything. It's, it's unreal. Um, I showed that image... Um, I might be able to share the screen with you now, actually, and just give oh, you. Please. We'll give you some great examples of this as we actually talk. That's probably a good. Um, I yeah. think you've disabled uh, screen sharing. You might have to just uh, disable that dis disability there. I'm not sure how you do that. Um, but I can actually just share with you uh, a compilation of images I've gathered from all these cultures who do do it. Um, but yeah, th this is where we get the image of a Nephilim looking like a clown from. You know, I've explained clearly that it's, it's this hybrid mix between dragons and humans that creates this big, wide, smiled image. Um, and maybe once I give a few examples of these ancestor culture worships, we'll get on to how this got into the modern world and where we got a clown from and how this is still... Yeah, so let's try this. So screen share. Perfect, I can share the screen. So I'll just share... Da -da -da. Is there a way to just? No. Oh, what am I doing? Right. What am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> um, now, now you got me question. Where are you really? <laughs> is there a way to just share desktop? Share my screen. Um, let's give Zoom permission to do everything. There we go. <laughs> You know what's crazy? Watching your videos made me think about also some of the, I don't know how I actually thought about that, but genies, genies and, and, and gin. I don't know how much you've looked into that, but I, I saw an article when I looked it up because I was thinking about Aladdin and some of these ideas that get put into our kids, uh, put, in, put into our brain since we're kids mm. about releasing something, right? You're, you're talking about 
what, what is, the genie seems like a friendly ordeal, some, whatever type of magical things gives you wishes and all this. But at the end of it, the idea is to free him, you know, free him from whatever, wherever he's confined from. And when I looked up uh, what's the historic nature of genies, obviously it's a uh, it's of uh, Islamic tradition. It, it, it dates back to them. It goes further back. But one of the things I saw was it said that genies were beholden. The only thing genies were beholden to their kings were angels. And I remember looking at that like, oh, snap. Paul, <laughs> even the big blue genie might be a Nephilim, uh, you know, son of a son of an angel. Uh, highly possible. Yeah, I mean, uh, genies come from jinn, which is the Islamic version of a demon, which means smokeless fire. Yeah. Um, and it's just a version of the same stories of disembodied spirits, absolutely. And the idea is that you have to do some kind of enchantment to release them from some kind of prison, which, again, we'll right. get into as we talk about the history here. But I think it's nice just to give like a slideshow as I'm discussing so you can Let's kind of it. see what I'm talking about here. But if I go to live images and I just go to rolling images, let's start with clown one. And can you see my screen here? Yep. So you can see these images. I think you're, are you on the middle of that screen right now? Do I need to move that to one side? Uh, no, I'm good. I'm up top with you. I see everything. Right. So you can see these two masks, for example. This is um, from ancient Greek and Roman theater. Um, so yeah. I'll just skip through, you know. So this is an African ancestor spirit worship example. Okay. Um, and again, these things dress like the things to channel the things. This is where they, uh, they are representing the spirits in the other realm. And naturally they've gone for white skin with polka dots and multicolored frills and, and all over the place. Um, this right. is the, one of the Raksha demons. This is a particular one in Sri Lanka. This is mm -hmm. the Raksha demon mask of Sri Lanka. And this is sure. a this is what a dragon-human hybrid would look like. Right. And this is what Red they would have looked like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Terrifying. Absolutely terrifying, right? And yeah, the yeah. notice the tongue sticking out. That's an extremely common motif you find all over the earth. So wherever you see this represented you're probably looking at an Ephilim creature. Mm. So the whole, all the patterns on the skin, for example, and here you have the checkerboard in the background as well. This is serpent skin. They're supposed to look like snakes. That's what they're going for here, okay? So here again in Africa, something similar. They're wearing a white skin mask with clownish-like features with multicolored pattern fractaled skin. This is what they're going. They're mimicking the spirits in the other realm, which are the spirit versions of these entities when they walked around as giants. Right. Understand? right. So they kind of look like this now in the spirit realm, more akin to jesters. But mm -hmm. in the physical world, they look something like this when they were knocking about. And this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with disembodied spirits of these creatures mm -hmm. today. But when they knocked about and actually were physical and eating people, they look something more akin to this. So very terrifying creatures. But this is kind of what they look like now in the spirit form. These are the DMT jesters. You know, these are the uh, Wakinian spirits of the Hayoka tribes in North America, but this is the African version of the same thing, you know, the black and white fractal panned creature. The, they, they seem to change their form slightly with regional variations, but um, as with the reptilian kingdom, there's variation throughout it of different snakes, right, different right. types of snakes, you know, but a snake's a snake and no matter what type you get, but there's certainly different styles of versions of them. But a human snake hybrid would look something like this. And these are <laughs> echoes. What we see in these costumes are like an echo of an ancient memory. These, right. these things were the gods of, of the people at one point. They are the ancestors who built the civilizations. These are the Nephilim who put themselves in rulership positions over these tribes once. And these tribes still remember them. So they act, they dress the way they do today in, in like an ancient oral tradition way. They, they, probably, they probably even forget why they do it. But these are memories you're seeing here coming through to right. the modern day in these costumes. And um, you got the Kabuki theaters and the theaters of, of China and Japan. And this is the Oni demon. This is their version of the Rakshasa. It's the same thing, a giant Oh, they call them ogres, you know, they have different names for them. But it's a giant, mm. wide grinned, book tooth, clown like, bulging guy features, wild, crazy red haired giants. These are the Nephilim. It's the same thing. Um, that's, we'll get into this later, but secret societies today in the West still venerate the jester and the clown, and we'll get into that later. But here's more African veneration versions um, exaggerated features, giant heads here with wide mouths and multiple colored patterns all over the face. 
Here's more examples of the spirit realm mim mimics in African ancestor spirit worship. Same again here. Here with these sound suits is how they've been interpreted in mod by our modern arts, but they're dressing here like frequency beings. So they dance in these costumes and wave themselves around really fast, and they look like a blur with the way the reeds just fly all over the place. It's because mm -hmm. they're, they're representing like high energetic frequency beings made of sound the spirits wow. that's what they're trying to represent there. they're trying to mimic something in the spirit realm and they right. probably see these things when they're tripping on all these hard psychedelics everywhere so that's why they know how to dress this way because they've seen it in the spirit realm so they're copying what they see in order to create a channel in order to let them into their body or to communicate with them in some way and that's what these practices are, are for they're not really for anything else and they'll tell you they'll tell you if you ask them it's not hidden because they don't, they don't see it as a problem or a bad thing. This is their culture. This is their, these are their gods. They're very serious. Right. You know, they don't, they don't, they're not going to hide it from you. But here's more examples of, of what I'm describing. So this is a common uh, thing. This happens quite, quite in quite a few places. Uh, but here's an example in Africa where they do this headboarding thing where they squash the infant's skull. But they do this on every continent. There's examples yeah. of these long type of, hanging yeah, the head yeah. or the or the neck with neck rings is another example yeah. as well yeah. you know but what they're trying to do here they have a beauty standard they've got from somewhere they're trying mm. to emulate something they consider worthy of veneration or beauty or power or high status or standard and it's kind of they do this because they, they they associate with it power okay? and this date backs to the head longing stuff head dates back to ancient egypt even pre-ancient pre mm -hmm. egypt i believe yes well i do believe there are humans who have attempted to elongate their skull through methods like this but then right. there were creatures that were knocking about at some point that actually had elongated skulls they weren't squash skulls they mm -hmm. had the they had the volume to actually back it up because you can squash a human skull as much as you want you can't increase the volume Right. Okay. But right. these skulls that have been found, like the Paracas skulls and the ones in and the Incan skulls and all mm -hmm. over the earth, they actually are elongated with more volume and they have a different suture on the skull as well than we do. We have ours splits into two. They have right. what they just have one around the back. So it's actually a different species. They're not human. That's crazy. You know, yeah. and it, it proves it just by the fact that they don't the skull has is not shaped as a human's would be. And where the neck connects to the skull is a completely mm -hmm. different place to where humans are as well. Because it has to be in order to support the weight evenly of the of the elongated skull. But these elongated features, clowns today, for example, often wear a skull cap, which makes it like they have a pinhead of some kind. Yeah. Because it's an emulation of something like they're doing in these cultures. And the clown costume is a perfectly crafted symbol which mimics and represents Nephilim features, just like mm -hmm. these cultures are doing when they dress like this. It's the same right. thing. They're trying to mimic Nephilim features, which I described to you as serpent-human hybrids. So this is where we get things like vampires from in the modern day. Same thing, white skin, uh, blood drinking. It's just another mimic version. The Nephilim were the first vampires, in a sense. They were drinking blood all over the place. It's documented very well. The life is in the blood. There's some kind of magic or witchcraft behind it, too. It was really a horrible time to be. So clowns... And the, the, the red lips could also represent blood around the lips? Is that, is that true? Yes, yeah. Quite literally, it could be a symbolic reference to their cannibalistic nature sure like when a child eats spaghetti bolognese and is just smeared with that red stuff right. that's probably what they would have looked like just chowing down on a human corpse you know whatever but also as that first image i showed you at the start they actually did have big red lips mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because a human has lips that are quite red and fleshy right. and puffy snakes don't they have no lips but you blend those two things together you get a snake-like being with lips it would look very weird it That's look... kind of smiling. It, are, are they interpreted yeah. to be smiling or is it just the way they're shaped that we interpret them as smiling? If, as if smiling? you look at a serpent head on, it looks like it's smiling at you. Smiling, right. But it's right. not. It's the way its mouth is shaped. It's just the way yeah. it's the way it works. So shri like when pit bulls look at you, they kind of have yeah, that smile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not. It's just by the nature of the wide mm -hmm. maw. Because uh, serpents dislocate their jaws to eat prey. 
I imagine right. the dragons could do this too, and so could the Nephilim. You know, they could open mm -hmm. the mouth really wide in a very terrifying sense. You know, think of like the ring, for example. You know, when they die, they have the mouth like wide open or something mm -hmm. like that. I think that was probably a hint to all these things as well. But uh, the Shriners, well, I'll just give you a hint here, while they are a, a step above Freemasonry. Freemasons were the ones who created the costume of a clown. It's well within the society, secret societies. And the Shriners, which are supposed to be an, an Arabic-themed sect of the of the the craft for some reason they all dress like western clowns they have a sect within each shrine that is dedicated to dressing like a clown um, mm. and that's odd why well my research kind of makes it clear it's because it's their gods they're in communication with these demons still right. today it never stopped this is just their way of publicly doing it without us realizing it so they created the clown to mimic the costumes worn by these people you know for the same purpose, to channel the spirits, but they do it publicly without us realizing it. So here's an example of the Sri Lankan demon, okay? This thing has a weird story. Uh, this thing basically was the son of a king, okay, who was abandoned and chucked away because he looked like this. And the king said, this is not my son. Okay, you've mm -hmm. cheated on me. My wife has cheated on me. Okay, this is not my son. You got uh, her Nephilim on, huh? Yeah, well, well. The funny thing is, if you go to Greek mythos, the gods, which is the pantheons of that of that region, you know, of Zeus, for example, and all the rest of them. Well, these are angels right. taking human form, OK, who have resided over humanity as gods and they see people as their oh, playthings, you know. Well, wow. The Greek pantheon, you're saying, could be interpreted as they were the angels, a part of the watchers? The like, rebellious angels who took human wives and mated with them. And they did. The Many stories in Greek mythos are literally of the angels raping human women in many right. sneaky ways, often taking the forms of things, forms of different things. To, to deceive them. And guess who they always went for? They always went for the, the queens or the daughters of kings. Why? It's because they're trying to birth legitimate heirs to thrones and kingships. They're usurping the thrones with their seed, their serpent seed, their dragon seed. And this is another example in Sri Lanka of the same thing. This king's wife gets pregnant and gives birth to one of these things. And the king's like, this ain't mine. <laughs> like, where did this come from? You know, and it's the same, the same thing was happening in, in Greece. Maury, Maury. Yeah, you know, the same thing was happening in Greece, sorry, mythos as well. The, the gods were always coming down and raping the wives of kings. In one story, Zeus, quite literally, for two weeks, is the king. He makes himself look like the king and sleeps with the king's wife for two weeks straight without her ever realizing it until he returns back on official business, you know what I mean? And he clears off. <laughs> yeah. This is what they're doing. This is the modus operandi. This is an agenda. There's a plot here. They want to get legitimate heirs who have a, a, a right to claim the thrones, officially speaking, into these positions of power. And this is where it began. So there, and this is... And so this, there's no way there could have been a, a, a just a thought like, oh, these angels came down here and saw these beautiful women and wanted to have sex with them. It seems like there was more of an intricate plot here. Yes. That we these angels wanted to put seeds of power on thr thrones of men mm -hmm. and take over the world or maybe have their own. Because there's also kind of like a science biology to there. They're obviously messing with genetics and trying to yes. create their own thing, you know, and Absolutely. I don't know. Yeah, it, it yeah. Just seems crazy. Yeah, well, it's in rebellion against God, this God's decision to put the the human of as as God over the earth, as king over the right. earth. They said no. We're going to be mm -hmm. kings over the earth, and our children are going to be kings over the earth. That's the rebellion. It's this, yeah. uh, and it, and it, God even says to the serpent in the Garden of Eden, "I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman." Okay, so this is the serpent seed talk, okay? People have always right. speculated, well, that, that must mean that Cain isn't actually human or Adam's son. The serpent must have had sex with Eve in the Garden of Eden, and now her child, Cain, from then on, is a serpent seed, you know? Now, I don't actually buy that. I think, I think what God was doing there was saying to the serpent race or maybe the the seraphim angels again it's, it's hard to tell exactly there's a realm of speculation here but he, mm. he he i think god knew what the plan was i think he was forewarning them before they even created the nephilim dragon human hybrids i know what your plan is but you're not going to win okay you may for a short season dominate the earth with your serpentine race 
and start corrupting things, but you will only bite the heel of the human race. They will crush your skull. They will win. He was telling them ahead of time before any of this was even done. And this is ex an example of what I'm showing on the screen here of one of the serpentine races. The, the, the son of a queen, a human queen, half angel, half human hybrid. And look what it looks like. It looks like a Rakshasa demon with the big wide grin, red lips, bulging eyes, multicolored pattern, fractal clothing, snakes associated with it everywhere, symbolically speaking. And this thing was eating humans. It's got a leg in its in its mouth there, you know. Um, it, oh, it, it's, seen, <laughs> it's usually holding two men in its arms by the by the torsos, you know what I mean? Just holding on to these two humans. And right. these little faces you see around it, or illnesses it can put on people. It had magical powers. It could spread death and disease and plagues wherever it went. And this thing is said to have grown up in a pile of bodies because it was just thrown into a body pit um, mm. at birth, as a baby. But it didn't die. It grew up really quick because it's a Nephilim. And that's what they do. They just right. keep growing. And it, it survived by eating the carcasses of all the dead things around it. And then it eventually emerged from its pit and then just destroyed like thousands and thousands and thousands of people just ate them just decimated the kingdom that his father ran who he claims rejected him out of anger and rebellion you know but then mm -hmm. he says i think it says then to solve this buddha came and fought with the beast or something and then talked it down and convinced it <laughs> just the whole other mythos of an angel coming to be the savior of the situation but i think there's a lot of that going on i think there's a lot of angels create nephilim nephilims cause problems angels coming off of the solutions there was a lot of that going on to make the angels out to be the saviors of mankind but right, it was right, but they right. caused the problem to begin with did you get what i mean it's like yeah it's, it's like a propaganda going on trying to like yeah say, we still look good here but <laughs> we're creating these monsters yeah but that, that's the that's the point like no one knew an angel actually created this thing officially you right. know because it's supposed to be the daughter of the, the king and queen they're sorry the, the child of the king and queen right but the king mm -hmm. was having none of it from the beginning he was like this ain't mine what have you been yeah. doing you know <laughs> like 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 you belong to the streets clearly because this is not my child it's that type of thing <laughs> it was one of those type of things you know yeah, but, yeah. but this is just one story this is one story of thousands you know this happens a lot and uh this is another example of a elongated uh skull of a of a african god mm -hmm. this is a trickster god of the um i can't remember what religion is specifically in africa but they have a creation myth that he came down to earth when it was nothing but water and started creating land and as it goes on but if you look at this the defining features wide bulging guys elongated skulls um this, it's them. a common descriptor of nephilim it's just another example of a serpent hybrid human of some kind which has been equated to be like godly in nature um right. here the here's some of the um this is like tibetan themed Book of the Dead stuff, but it also has mm -hmm. like a Hindu influence. And these are just uh, dead, hungering spirits, you know, and they're quite thin and fleshly. But if you look at them, they've got these big, wide grins, unnaturally human grins with the book sharp teeth um, mm -hmm. and pale white skin. Um, in, in Japan, they have like a, what are known as hungering, wandering spirits, which again, look very similar. And funnily enough, that's the same description given to demons um, in the Bible and the Book of Enoch, they wander in dry places, they hunger and thirst, but have no means to satisfy these lusts and urges because they don't have a body. So they seek people's bodies to possess them in order to use their senses to feel things once more. So you, the same stories everywhere in these the examples. Now, people believe, some people believe when we die, we our souls just wander the earth. And some of these cultures yeah. do believe they're just talking to their relatives. Biblically speaking, that does not happen. The only thing on the other side that's stuck there are these things, the Nephilim. They cannot leave the earth. They cannot go up or down. They are, they are of the earth and in the earth. They shall remain in physicality, in death and in spirit, in physical and spirit. So when they die, they just they remain here. And that's the only thing you, can, you really are communicating with. In the dead, in the dead realm, you know, the astral realms. So that's what I think these are just another representation of. The spirit version of these creatures, you know, it's the same. And when we, the only times we really kind of get a, 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 a gl glance at these things is uh, through psychedelics. A lot of people are saying, right, mm -hmm. through that that psychedelic realm of reality. It, yeah, you, a lot of people have claimed to seen these type of things or gestures or, or clowns or uh, all types of similar look at this right here red nose mm -hmm. it, there is something to it where all these it's too similar it's too similar where these things all these cultures are sharing 
the same type of character, this white face or this bug eyed, kind of smiling, tongue out or red hair, all these giant that they talk about giants and they always seem to end up. I mean, the, the only conclusion is if you go back to the oldest sources that we have that said, yo, these things were here. Exactly. You know, exactly. And, yeah. They just go by many names. So a lot of people have always equated their specific culture to be unique against everybody else's because it's, yeah. it, it's kind of regional, you know, and why would they know about any anybody else's culture necessarily? But when you actually start pattern recognitioning all of them, you realize they all have very similar stories with very similar characters with very similar physical aesthetical features. And again, this is the Selknam tribes of the South Americas right at the tip of South America. And they're dressing in these polka dot black and red and white patterned psychedelic clothing, just like you saw the African tribes doing earlier, you know, mm -hmm. um, in these versions. Like, yeah. it's the same thing, but they're completely yeah, separated the by vast swaths of ocean and land, thousands upon thousands of miles, you know. But why do they all, they're all seeing the same thing in the spirit realms. Like, what this, what you see here in Africa is identical to what I just showed you there from the tip of South America for the Selknam tribes. Like, it's how... How can they have the same designs? And because uh, they all share the same history, they all saw the same thing. They're all trying to venerate something that was in the ancient past. They're all looking at the same creatures in the spirit realm. There's something going on where the, that's connecting them all together to have this this visual aesthetical similarity. And they're all clownish features by a Western standard, which is why I have the title: "The Nephilim Looks Like Clowns." You know, the truth mm -hmm. is, na clowns are quite literally modelled after Nephilim. It's the other way around, you know. And these, this is, for example, this is uh, the Wakinyan spirit, the thunder gods of North America, the Dakota peoples mm -hmm. of North America. And they dress like this, like a Hayoka, in order to channel this specific thunder spirit, in order to intercede with it and, and hopefully flee to it not to bring destructive thunder and rain <laughs> okay and they're hoping to dress like the thing to channel the thing to talk to it to tell it not to bring destruction upon us that's the aim of the hayoka and then they also take on a, sh a shamanistic spiritual leader role as well within the tribe where they are the ones who are in connect in connection with the spirits but they also act as contrarians to to teach people about things about the societal norms they should follow so they're also seen as clowns in a sense as well because of their mm -hmm. contrarian nature. And these are called right. clown societies in the North America, but um, th there's just too many similarities in every culture. I'm going to, I'm, I'm showing you a vast swath here in just these few images alone of very different cultures, you know, with different histories and stories, but they all share the same theme. You know, look at this polka dots, white skin mm -hmm. polka dot patterns, elongated skull cap there. Um, this is back to Papua New Guinea, the same thing. They're trying to, emulate something with his headdress you saw the red nose one earlier didn't you yeah and um, that's also papua new guinea red feathered headdress wild red hair with a red nose it's it's there you know um just the versions of clowns this is um a particular clown spirit as well in 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 um in japan and again i think snakes come in all sh forms and colors and sizes so we will see variations okay yes, but there's a reason right. why this the why they are the way they are is what i'm saying uh, again, this is a Rakshasa representation of India. Another example there of an Oni. Back to Papua New Guinea. I mean, if you watch a lot of uh, anime, I mean, Japanese, they, they constantly have either uh, these type of creatures or literally mm. clowns as bad guys. Yeah. You know, similar to the... I was watching this one anime called Hunter Hunter, and one of their main, like, powerful evil villains is this jester clown-looking guy that, you know, has his does some type of sorcery or something and i'm like you know there, there's something to this <laughs> they, uh -huh. they keep showing us or they people remember it subconsciously or it's just in our the ethos of our cultures or something but hmm. it's interesting. well this would have been the mark of cain here for example this is what i'm talking right. about this is how these things right. would have looked the humans at the time you know um and when you max mash that together with a dragon you get something that looks like maybe this you know? right, right right it gets a bit wild it gets a bit weird you know um you go from being ashy to a dragon yeah but here's papua <laughs> new guinea again a very isolated cannibalistic tribe in papua mm. new guinea and they wipe the face up and put red on the nose with polka dots these are clown aesthetics by our standards nice. in the West, okay. This is where Even they the cone hair type. Yeah. Of, the this is hair. to when we made when the Freemasons formed the clown. They were looking at these cultures and copying them. This is what they're doing. 
And that's so, you know, this is where we get it from. It's a mimicry of these cultures. There's Monsters, Inc., interdimensional demons who feed off the energy of fear of people and laughter, which is what a clown does. It induces either fear or laughter in people because they feed off that type of energy when you're channeling one of them. So I thought that was quite funny. It is literally an interdimensional oh, uh, d- demonic monster who manifests physically as a clown in order to feed off the fear of people. It uses fear to to infuse the physical blood with adrenochrome so we can then go on to mm-hmm. feed off them it's kind of like salting their meal before they eat it you know what I mean? that's kind right, of how they right, see it yeah. um and i thought it's interesting that they incorporated a clown into that as well stephen king probably knew all this he's probably an insider and he has nothing no new ideas of absolutely. his own you know absolutely um but here's that same cannibalistic tribe i'm not sure if this guy knows he's in, he's in serious danger or not but <laughs> you know <laughs> They have the white face, a red nose thing with the polka dots. Doesn't know how delicious he looks to them right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, uh, again, more examples. And, you know, this practice right. of dressing like a clown to channel the spirits in order to gain something from it, would that be power or fame or immortality or strength or whatever it is, whatever you want, uh, the music industry know this and they use this to their own advantage. All artistic industries use this. The secret of the industry is... Dress like a psychedelic clown monster and you probably will get famous and rich. You will be elevated. Um, because the people who rule the industry are in the game of finding people who dress this way and putting them in positions of veneration in front of audiences so more people copy them. The more people you can get copying these idols who dress like clowns, the more channels you're opening up. So it's, a, mm-hmm. it's quite nefarious when you see it on the surface. Mm-hmm. But you'll find the more famous these people get, the more they start to look like a clown. The whiter the skin gets, the more colourful the clothing gets, or yeah. the hair, the redder their lips get. It's because they're, u- they're utilising something. White skin, red lips, multicoloured hair is a channeling tool. Right. It's, it's an right, occult right. practice, okay? It's, an, it's, a, it's a magic. It's witchcraft at its finest form. And these people know it. And it's it's a it's a part of the higher up knowledge. It's the wisdoms they get taught, and uh, you know makeup. You have to be careful about what you do with makeup and clothing. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's actually very serious, and we don't think this way in the West because we're not trained to see it that way. And uh, funnily enough, most of our versions of the Nephilim in Europe we call the Wild Man. Um, yeah. We think we dress this way to scare away evil spirits. Just like Halloween, it's the same principle. You're dressing like things to confuse them, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But who's right? The culture who dress like these things for thousands of years to be possessed by them? Or our cultures who dress like this in the past 200 years to scare them away? It's probably the ancient cultures who are channeling them by dressing like them. It's a very naive view to think that dressing like a demon is somehow going to scare it. I think it's right. I think it's foolish, and a lot of people do not like me saying that. They get offended, but I'm allowed to have an opinion, and the evidence seems to show that dressing like the thing opens up a channel to it. It doesn't scare them away, so it's it's a it's a foolish practice if you if you don't want to take it from me, you know. But here again, another example of polka dot skin: uh, children being utterly terrified of clowns by nature. That's uh, a weird one, isn't it? Like, yeah. I mean, we have so many natural fears as humans that we all share heights and, uh, you know, what else? Uh, and probably snakes and things like this. But clowns, like, how did that get into our conscious? Clowns, we're all kids, everything kind of. It's meant to be for kids, but it ends up being scary. Th- I don't know who in the world goes to relax to watch a clown. <laughs> Whether to go to a circus and say, oh, yeah, I really want to go see this clown it's just usually a horrifying creature or how they kind of perverted in it and other things like this it's usually it's never yeah. really that jolly or the sad clown yeah. or something well no kids are instinctually terrified of clowns studies have been done actually and i think it's like one in ten children actually like clowns um why they've been associated with children is makes no sense when you look at the data and you get these right. old photos of like children screaming with fear at the prospect of being in the arms of this monster and then you get in the background the parents laughing like it's funny and cute and it's like it's like you're traumatizing this child like and i think it's i think it's like an instinctual thing because if it's like a predator response if these things used to eat us and they were predators and we were prey i think that might be ingrained in the collective psyche of humanity in our blood in our dna to naturally be terrified of anything with these type of features and maybe it's just like it's just in us now, you know, from a, a mass trauma event of all of collective humanity at one point. Um, but funnily enough, the big red nose is a real genetic condition. 
that we can trace that all, that primarily pale skinned people get and it's called a rhino fiber so here's an example oh and the only way you can cure it which this woman has clearly done is you have to cut it off you shave it off with a hot wire that's the only way you get rid of it so you, you remove it, you scrape it away with a very hot wire until, the, until you and you sculpt a normal looking nose out of that bulbous thing. That's how you get get it get rid of it. And that this happens. Um, it's 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 colloquially called terminal rosacea. It's end stage rosacea. It's like the maximum level rosacea can manifest in its worst case scenario. And rosacea comes with red blotches and patches all over the skin, and it's primarily a white person problem. Um, and But it is a genetic condition. It's not just something all white people get. It's a genetic defect, and you have to have the condition to have this happen to you. It won't just happen because you're cold or you drink too much alcohol, which a lot of people believe quite naively. It has nothing to do with that. Either you have the genetic condition or you do not. And it's called the curse of the Celts, because it's predominantly Northern European people who get this. Some other races are you born with it. Is it? Is yeah. it all mac- not not just the 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 gene, but are are you born with the physical attribute? No, it it develops as you age. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, but you're born with the defect. When you either have it right. or you don't, and and right. it's called the curse of the Celts because it's predominantly a Northern European issue. It can't happen in any race. Any race at all can get this, but it's like ninety eight percent white people <laughs> that's how it works um and I, I actually have a version of this called hemochromatosis i won't okay. get mine won't manifest like this mine has to, more to do with, with the way my body processes iron i can't process it so it just builds up in me most people their body would use the iron to make red blood cells or repair tissue and then you would urinate all the excess iron out I don't. My body just keeps storing it and storing it and uh, storing it until it overspills in my organs and becomes toxic, and then I die. That's basically the, my right. version. So I have to regularly keep it down by getting blood drawn because iron's in the blood. You know. How often do you have to do it? Um, well, I'm actually at the end of my treatment now. It was extremely dangerously high, uh, but it's almost back to normal levels now after having about eight venesections. And then once it's back to normal levels, it can take months for it to go anywhere near over. So it, after this, it'd be like once every half a year, I have to go and just get a bag taken out of me just to knock it down a peg again. Uh, right. But that's kind of, it's a lifelong condition. It's the genetic corruption. It's kind of, right. I was born with it because my parents carried the two things as well. And they came together. And by chance, that means I now have it. But they were carriers. And because both genes came together in my parents, I've got the full problem. But the, it's really odd. It's like in the chances of getting this and manifesting the way it does is rare. But in some right. cases, it manifests like you see this lady here. Very extreme cases. Um, but she, but you either have the iron problem or you have the rosacea problem. It's one of the two. I don't have the rosacea issue. I have the iron issue. But uh, this is funny right. because when we're talking about white skin things. Well, the, you know, Cain's lineage were the whitest and the Nephilim are very pale skinned. So it's possible they also, in some way, have this condition where they end up with a big red bulbous nose of some kind you know and that's why the nephilim feature is in a clown a red nose of some kind maybe it actually was a real thing older nephilim as they age developed it's very possible you know as it just features being manifested in caricatured forms this is a caricature of a real condition the nephilim would have had right and yeah it's, it's really bizarre um here's an indian tradition called the Thayum. This person dresses this way in order to be possessed by the spirit. And then the people offer it things like live chickens or whatever. And the guy who's possessed by the spirit will rip the heads off those chickens and just eat it whole and do also and drink the blood and I've do all sorts of things, things. Like you know, because yeah. th- they have to take the sacrifice, you know, because that's what the thing in them wants. It wants to drink mm. blood. So you give it blood by drinking it and it experiences that feeling through your body. Do you get what I mean? And then it, in yeah. return, it gives wisdom to the village. They ask it questions and it tells it things. Things only a spirit could know about what a certain person's doing thousands of miles away, for example, or things like that. You know what I mean? Or uh, Was it, it the Dogon that knew where the, the Ceres B or some, one yeah. of these planets were or something like that too? Yeah. Like how would you know that if it possibly wasn't for information? Like They know? knew things you can only know with a modern telescope. 
Yeah, they, right. knew, they knew things which were just way beyond their capacity to understand because the knowledge was likely given to them by spirits that they had channeled in the past. Absolutely. It was fish right. spirits that came out of the river. So, you know, that's probably just another play on like a, a water element angel, you know, mm. which right, then right, right. this is because they said angels are attached to certain geographical locations and elements and things like that. Like the water dragons of China, I mentioned, maybe they encountered like a fish water element or something that they claim fell from the sky, by the way. And the angels were said to have been cast down in rebellion. <laughs> There's all sorts of things That's going right. on. Um, here's the cookery in Europe, in Bulgaria. They have their own version. Here's an old Sri Lankan mask of the Raksha. So you can see the Nephilim were wild looking creatures. And the clown we have today is based off of them. And we do rituals every year in, in the West called Red Nose Day, where they get all the public to dress <laughs> up like a clown. Uh, these are giant invocation rituals. These are not just fun for the kids to raise some money for charity. Okay, they've got us all playing the game. This yeah. is this is they're very sneaky about it. He is. Um, I mean, is, you're right though. Like even I, I, that might be older or man, not familiar with, to me the the red nose thing. But like like you showed earlier, things like music where Doja Cat. You had that picture of her. There's so many musicians and people doing this type of like. I used to call it uh, artists dressing like superheroes. Hmm. Like they 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 always have this exaggerated look. But when you talk about it, it kind of correlates more with clowns. <laughs> like they dress like clowns. They dress like some type of out of this world thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe it makes you more popular. Maybe it draws eyes to you. And could it rub off on younger people wanting to dress like that? Well, we know that that uh, the, the cultural leaders and stuff often influence young people to dress how they dress and listen to what they listen to read what they read watch what they watch so absolutely yeah, yeah. i mean here here's clint eastwood for example the famous song by the gorillas it's the music video yes. and it shows them in, in a white void playing music playing the ritualistic beats the summoning ritual mm -hmm. and then what happens is it cracks open and then the drummer is possessed Okay, from doing the ritualistic tribal drumming. And then what bursts out of him is this thing, which is a clown spirit with pale bluish dead skin with red lips. And it's a giant. It's stomping around. And the first words it says is, finally, someone's let me out of my cage. Time to me is nothing. I'm showing no age. And he goes on to explain how he's a timeless, immortal being and how he influences the entire music industry. He's the one whispering in the ears of all the famous people. He writes all the songs that you listen to. Okay. And he does it through Russell, the, the fictional drummer in this example, you know, and he's the one who creates the beat. Um, so, yeah, sorry, th there you go. You know, it's, it, they hinted it all the time. The music industry knows. Feels good. That's exactly, you know. <laughs> That's they, what the Netflix are saying when they come out. <laughs> well, yeah, basically, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I mean, these images just go on forever. This is just one. Um, yeah. Let's see what else we've got here. So, uh, China, they have their examples. Here's another... Uh, odd tribe in Papua New Guinea. They wipe the skin up and put red reeds all over their body to give themselves red hair. And I mean, we see these things all the time. We just never ask why. Exactly. Why with the white paint? Why with these type of faces? Why? Like, oh, we're just not, we just accept it as, oh, cultures are different. Mm -hmm. People just have different ways. Yeah, so this culture in Africa, they believe the tallest men with the whitest eyes and the whitest teeth or the most attractive and they do this mating dance ritual where they trip balls on psychedelic amphetamines and chatter their teeth making a droning noise gurning like hell basically <laughs> and they do it for hours and hours and hours and hours and the ones who can do it for the longest and the ones who can jump the highest uh attract the women you know and this is a beauty standard that they've picked up from somewhere and look at the way they do what they do to themselves and the paint they use here actually is called coal k-o-h-l and this is antimony this is made from a specific powder from a metal called antimony and it said in the book of enoch it was the angels who taught mankind the use of antimony for this purpose of enchantments and these mm. tribes are still using antimony specifically to paint their face up to channel these entities <laughs> for enchantment purposes so it's kind of <laughs> it, crazy. it's ancient knowledge you know and it's the same metal lead based paints they're using here 
the method of antimony to make right. these makeups and that they use for ritualistic purposes of channeling entities. Uh, today, we don't use lead-based paint in the West because it's poison, but, <laughs> but these <laughs> these tribes do still do it, you know, they still use it. Um, and I thought that was interesting that even in the Book of Enoch, it clearly says that this was given to them as wisdom from the angels to use this stuff. And people have always said, oh, well, you know, the angels taught them makeup so the women could attract men, and it's all about lust. Not at all. I think they taught them these practices dress like the thing to channel spirits that they taught mm -hmm. them a powerful tool to communicate with the spirit realm that gave them esoteric wisdom you know of how to be more powerful right. a, a more powerful wizard is what they were teaching them esoteric secrets that mankind shouldn't really know because no good ever comes from it that's what they were teaching them and I think the use of makeup as a tool to channel spirits was one of those things that was taught by the Watchers. Um, so you don't think at all the beauty aspect has nothing necessarily to do with it? It's, it's, it's the lowest tier of what it has to do with it. Gotcha. It's, it's gotcha. certainly a part of it, the beautifying of the eyelids in order to deceive people. And, but, and, and, you know, and, but the ultimate way of using makeup is for this purpose, to channel things that are on the other side. Like That's the, the most powerful way of, of using it. Um, the Royal Order of the Jesters, a step above uh, shrining. They also venerate the, the Jester in a quite literal sense. Um, here's a, another Rakshas mask from Barley Plays. This is um, Rangda the Demon Queen. <laughs> okay. Just like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look at these things. Um, that's a clown by any standard, you know, with the horrible Absolutely. wide smile and the bulging eyes. Back to Papua New Guinea again, more African. Um, this is the Selkanum tribes I mentioned earlier from South America. Who, by the way, the Selknum are now all but extinct. They were genocided big time, really? um, massively. They were just absolutely wiped out. The population was like 10,000. There's now like 50 or something What part like of South that. America is this? Literally, think... literally South America, you know, the, the tip. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Right, closest to the South Pole tip, that whole region. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they just basically filled that whole tip up. and uh, But they were, through colonization, of um, they were just... They were just decimated, uh, which is which is sad. Here's serpent skin as an example of where they pick up these colourful designs from. You know, now this is this clown-looking thing is quite literally painted on an ancient piece of Greek pottery. Uh, it's on the chest of Athena. Okay, now Athena is a fallen angel goddess, a giant goddess. Okay, um, she's the god of wisdom and war. Funnily enough, mm -hmm. <laughs> she's seen as those things. She was gifted the head of Medusa by Perseus after it was cut off. And she wears the head of Medusa on her chest as a pendant for protection, okay? And this was a style that was picked up all throughout Roman and Greek culture. Um, as a, You put them on shields, these heads on shields with the tongue sticking out, these Nephilim faces, this thing here, uh, as, a, as a seal of protection, as a good luck That's charm, insane. you know? But this thing is quite literally painted as a clown. But this is a Gorgon, okay? This is what it's, rep it's representing Medusa. This is what Medusa. That's crazy. This is what Medusa I mean, every really looks like. Every interpretation of Medusa we have is with the snake hair and stuff. To see this, that looks exactly like a clown. Yeah, that looks exactly like a clown. That that modern like interpretation of Medusa with the snakes for hair is more metaphorical of her serpentine blood. She didn't look like that. She looked like a clown, and she had legs like a human and right. wings. And I'll show you some depictions exactly. But this is again, this is the Hayoka and the um the pueblo clowns of the americas the american plains these are the clown societies um these are the contraries as they would call them and they play a sacred role in the cultures um but they are clearly emulating something they've seen in the past these are the serpentine looking creatures the nephilim that were once around um clowns again this is the hacker of new zealand this is the the aboriginal hmm. face paint they wear with the tongue sticking out they're trying to look like something they make their eyes bulge while they're doing it you know they're emulating something that distills fear in the hearts of their enemies you know that's hmm. the point of it hmm. um this is the batibola of rio the janeiro and that when carnival happens they have their own little carnival in the ghettos and this is how yeah. they dress and they brought this over from portuguese ancestor spirit worship cultures of the wild man venerations which is from the kuretos but this is a modern interpretation and they lean heavily into clownish looking stuff and um, the vegigantes as well this is another example of the same thing in a, in a similar region of brazil um this is the basla fastnach of switzerland a festival lent carnival again from europe where they all dress like clowns for a night. Um, and this is the cookery 
or Bulgaria, where they do the same thing, and they believe they're scaring away the evil spirits before they fast. But it's, you know, these other cultures don't believe they're scaring anything away. They're, they're channeling them. These guys are channeling them. These guys think they're scaring them away. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like they right, can't, right. they can't the both thing. be right. Unfortunately, right. only one of them's working, and I think it's the channeling. Okay, yeah. I, you know, and here's uh, early circuses. Uh, this is uh, the Barnum and Bailey's combined circus with the Ringling Bros. That's an unnaturally wide smile, right? Humans yeah. don't have teeth like that. It's because they knew what they were doing when they did this. They're emulating Nephilim features, the wide grin, serpentine mouth of a Nephilim creature. Um, here, back to India again in the Theum. This is the Kuretos of Portugal. This is their wild man. Okay, and from these older Celtic traditions, which dominate all of Europe, you then get the modern versions in carnivals in the colonized Americas like this. Mm. But the, the original form is this. Okay, so that's what that's the cultural brought over to the Americas. This is what they brought over, the Kuretos, these type of things. And they're literally yeah. representing giant hairy demons <laughs> right, that were very colorful, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. The Nephilim of Europe, the European version of Nephilim. Every culture has their own version, and the wild men giants of Europe, this is how they represent them in their costumes. Okay. Um, and this is how they do it in Switzerland. Here's what you were talking about with the stilts earlier. Yep. yep. Same thing. Um, you know, clowns wear stilts because they're representative of being a giant. It's right. a metaphor for Nephilim symbolism, you know. Um, Johnson Circuses again. Here's back to India. Polka dots, red polka dots on the skin. Speaking uh, of India, real quick, do you feel that some of their gods, and not to offend anybody, but some of their gods of their pantheon of gods, like the I think Vishnu, the blue one, and and the ones with the many hands, and and the monkey type of looking one, like do you think some of those were either Nephilim or angels? It's it's it, I think it's a mix of both. I think I think India has a very different flavor of yeah. of, of religion than most of the places. I get the feeling Indian gods are talking about an even more far ancient time than most of the places. Because they talk really? about times where the gods were at war with each other and there was nothing but gods on the earth. And they all had a massive war with each other and completely destroyed the place. With, like millions of years ago. Right? Yeah, with like extremely powerful weapons and Vimana right. flying machines and nuclear war type destruction. You know, that's what a lot of what the mythos of, of these ancient uh, Vedic texts, you know, these, these Hindu texts talk about. And I think they might be talking about a time even before Adam, even before the earth as we know it. Because it, it says in the beginning, the earth was form and void. And it's as though it's been made form and void by something that happened and God's starting again. It seems to be that type of language, you know, and it's possible the angels used to be the first creation in a sense that had the earth and they utterly destroyed the thing and through the stories and tales of these ancient gods of, of the Hindu. Oh, mythos, you, know? you just blew my mind just now. And I think Gary Wayne discussed this at this I concept think. with me, which blew my mind. And that's really? how that's how he's kind of pieced it into this the, the chronology, if you want to call it this, because we're, we're playing a game so the here. Angels you know, angels could have been like God's original, yeah. new life, and they went to war. They destructed. They they're the Indian and some of the maybe other gods of distant distant past that we think of. Maybe. Yeah, and maybe, or it could God be quite. Over with us. It could quite literally also just be they're just just playing the same game in that region as the Greek gods were in in the European regions. Right, right, they're just right, right. they're just these fallen angel watchers in rebellion, Watch. posing as pantheons. You could just say that as well. It's like the Norse exactly. gods as well. In this, all the same thing. You know, wherever you go, where there's a pantheon, where or even like the the sun worship gods or the dragons of the feathered serpents of Quetzalcoatl of North America were playing that game over there of literal dragon gods everywhere, or the dragon gods of um, again the Jade Emperor of China, or the rainbow serpents of of um, and the Wangina offspring of australia you know i think wherever you go they played their own game depending on what the people would believe and go with but in india does have this this very unique way of doing it which implies a far more older tradition as well You're right really old really but then obviously later traditions do appear which may be more akin to something like the pantheons of of uh egypt 
you know, as well as, right. as Greek and all these type of things. And you can see a lot of people have done side by side comparisons of the new gods and they're very similar to the pantheon of Egyptian gods in India. And you could say they were talking about the same gods, the same of the European pantheons of the Celtic regions as well. And it's like you, you just see patterns emerge, you repeat patterns. And it seems like the angels had a formula they like to follow wherever they went. And don't forget, there was 200 of them. So they could easily devise themselves up into 20 different pantheons of 10 and just right. take over a region each, you know, <laughs> like there's nothing stopping them from coordinating like that and having their own style. Um, but it's, it's the aesthetical similarities. When you start looking at them, you realize that there's, there's a thread here that runs through all of them and the Nephilim kind of tie it all together quite easy, more, a lot more easily. And right. I think a lot of people need to get out of this idea that their unique culture is unique. They're mm -hmm. not, they're not, the far from it, you know, and, and just because you've believed it your whole life as the one, the one way doesn't mean that other people aren't doing the exact same thing just by a different name over there. And you have to wonder why it's the same, you know, there's, there's something, there's something odd going on. Right. And uh, again, the, the practices involved with a lot of these cultures are highly questionable and it does usually involve communication with the spirit realm through dressing like this. Uh, right. Here's another African example, very clownish. Here's the insane clown posse playing the same game, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> look at that party hat they're wearing there. You have to wonder where we get our pom-pom covered party hats from. Are they right. mimicking these things, you know, and it's for mm. the kids. But these are tools. These are witchcraft tools, essentially. And we get kids to wear them at their birthday. You know? It always starts being like, you know, catered the thing to kids. I wonder why mm -hmm. that is. Absolutely. Look at these ones, you know, very clownish, um, very childlike as well. Um, this is the Lazarus, which is just down the road from the Kratos you saw earlier in Portugal. Yeah. They are literally looking like devils and demons with horns. They went a bit a uh, next step above, you know, um, red nose here. This is the theme of India again. Uh, they're all trying to represent something. This wow. is the Batibola of Rio. Um, back to the, this is a dancing of, um, this is a particular dance to do in an African tribe. I can't remember the name now, but it's, it's an impressive dance, actually very fast, very insane, mm. but they, they look like a blur. They're trying to make themselves look like a vibrating creature in like a, a mm -hmm. imperceptible way. You know, that's the aim. Here's the uh, the clowns of America's again, the Pueblo and the Hayokas. Here's a Rakshasa represented in oh, Indian artwork. <laughs> Pale white skin, fiery red hair, cannibalizing a human, just tearing them apart. <laughs> Big wide grin. Big wide grin here from that tribe again, trying to attack females. Um you see this is monsters inc by the way just there <laughs> making a it's joke everywhere there. yeah it's everywhere i mean it, media it, religions it's just everywhere and then and paul i don't know how much longer i have you for but i i do want one thing i do want you to touch on is is it going to westernize it now the whole charles charles dibden thing yeah with it coming you know uh that comparison to the indian iconography is like pretty spot on in my sure opinion, you know? sure so, no other... i do have um luckily most of those files on hand here actually and i think they're in this folder um okay so to summarize this very quickly i do go into this into a lot of detail on my channel and i have to, i've said this story a lot yes. but uh, what we where we get a modern clown from is is from a movement called the comede del arts okay and the Camille de l'Arts were, were a roving gang of actors who got together after the collapse of Rome and traveled all throughout Europe, putting on quick improvised shows on very quickly made stages. OK, and they had stock characters like you see here on the screen. OK, um, they had the servants of the rich man, the other servants of the rich man, the daughter of the rich man, the rich man, um, just the baker's woman, the, the, just just people an ordinary audiences would recognize is where the stock characters came from okay were they initially for royals only or was it always for the mass this is for the masses peasants this movement this particular movement this really? is just okay. for this is just for town squares they would go from one village to the next quickly okay. put on a show put some money in a hat move on to the next place okay they were like a, right, they were like right. they were vagrants you know they were they were mm -hmm. outcasts because during a highly uh, catholicized rome in europe acting was frowned upon it was seen as like being a prostitute it's really a lowly right, right. a lowly profession for for liars who put on a false mask and pretend to be things they're not you know it was frowned upon so that's why they had to kind of leave rome <laughs> in a way 
<coughs> this Italian tradition spread all throughout Europe, and it began to in two hundred years later. It settled in theatres, as a as a as a pantomime, you would call it. And France had their own flavour, and Britain had their own flavour as well. In London, by the way, I'm calling all my actor friends from now on prostitutes. Just to <laughs> Well, in a way, yeah, they are for hire, aren't they? You know, to pretend they to be some, to be to pretend to be something they're not. You know, and it's kind of it's seen as like naturally sinful and deceitful by nature to be an actor. You know, that's right. kind of how they saw these things. So they had to adapt and travel, and put on these quick shows. You know, and a tradition was born, and people joined it like a traveling circus, and tra people were trained at how to do the routines of specific characters. You know what I mean? And th there was things that became expected of certain characters, you know, mm -hmm. of ways they should behave. And they were all, in a way, clowns. They were all humorous in their own way, you know, right. and they all had their own thing going for them. But Harley Quinn, who you see here as Arlecchino, was brought in 1671 as a relatively late addition. This is like a thousand years after the movement began, you know. Arlecchino here was added, and he's basically Harley Quinn. Now, Harlequin is named after Helikins, which is a um, a wild man of France. Okay, Helikins is what they called this wild man beast of the French region. And don't forget, I showed you earlier, the wild man tradition is everywhere. All over yeah. Europe. It's not just France. It's in Portugal. I showed you the Kratos. I showed you the Romanian uh, cookery. But it's, it's in every continent. Every country on that continent has a wild man tradition where they dress like a wild hairy beast like this and do these things this is what harley quinn is based on okay they've based and is that any relation to the nephilim you think or that yes the wild men were completely different this is uh this is the europeans version of the nephilim this is this is what they look like maybe it's because okay. they adapted to the region it was colder they have they were hairier in europe i don't know but this is their version of wild man eating giants okay wait, this is... wait, was there any connection to what do i call those ancient our cousins um in europe they were the the, the, the... neanderthal neanderthal because i've heard i've heard that neanderthals possibly looked more like this than just us with a big forehead maybe i've also heard i've also heard that neanderthal quite literally was just a way of covering up nephilim remains um so it could be that you know Ooh, paul coming with the conspiracies today <laughs> let's go because they because right, they, they had like thicker features than us they were sturdier more well built right. you know what i mean and these were giants at the end of the day and i don't know it's this you could speculate for hours on that but uh yeah, yeah, yeah. either way everywhere in europe they do dress this way and this is what more often it looks like very colorful with these wide smiles Okay, so they weren't necessarily just like hairy beast men like this necessarily. They were also quite colourful creatures as well. And you see a lot of representations right. like this. Or or you see these plain, boring, modern representations where they were just hairy men. But I think they looked more like this when they were knocking about. Quite colourful and wild and crazy. Um, really, really out there. And therefore, Harley Quinn was kind of modelled after this very popular tradition, which was all over Europe which everyone would recognize the wild man. So he became a stock character in the form of Harley Quinn or Harley Chino. Um, and mm -hmm. this is what he originally looked like. Quite patchworky all over the place, multicolored with a beast mask. Um, his mask was like this, covered in hair, right. uh, with his wide lips and elongated eyes. And he had this horn on his forehead, quite patchwork and multicolored, quite demonic looking. You see an actor actually here wearing the, the traditional costume, if I can find it. And he does look quite terrifying, actually, wearing this thing. It doesn't look... Uh, I don't know. It, it, something about it is really, really grotesque. Uh, so there's the royalty copying the way the Nephilim looked as well. They, they were definitely into it. There you go, like this. It's quite a, a brutish looking thing, you know, in, in, in a sense. Mm. Um, but it's modeled after the wild man. But there he is in his all his early forms. He's like a demonic, weird, conjoined, evil character. He was meant to represent yeah. the, the demonic entity within the play. That was his role, because he's quite literally modeled after the Nephilim demons of Europe. So there you go. There's the first proto clown. Now, the he was he was cast as a zany character, as a servant for the rich man. Okay, and he would often have a back and forth uh, kind of comedic routine 
with um, the other servant of the rich man, which was Pedrolino. So there's Harley Quinn again, looking quite brutish and weird with his red lips. So this is Pedrolino. Pedrolino was the other servant. And they would always kind of have like a, a who can be the worst servant comedy. Or there was many routines they could play this back and forth with. But the most popular one that became the most famous is that Harley Quinn here would steal the daughter of the rich man, which is Columbine. Okay. And she, they would run away together. And mm -hmm. Pedrolino here in the middle would chase after them with the rich man. So they would try and get his daughter back from Harlequin, right. okay? And that was the comedic routine. So here's a diamond patterned idea of a wild man. That's where the Harlequin gets his diamond patterned clothing from. It's a mimic of this. It's to also represent tufts of hair. Um, here's the wild man tradition of the cookery in Bulgaria. This is what they were copying, okay? Um, so anyway, this routine comes. Arli Chino would run away with the daughter of the rich man. Arlecchino was also modelled after some Mediterranean symbolism of um, Mercury here with his staff, you know, mm. quite f quick witted, fleet of foot, able to do right. acrobatic feats that were so unhuman, like no human could do these things. He was supposed to represent that that weird energy. He would do pretty rude things with his slap stick. He always had this stick with him which he slapped the stage with, which would then change the scene instantly. You know, he was um, he was a demon with magical powers. That was Harley Chino, that's Harley Quinn, modelled after Helikins, the French version of Wild Men. So there you go. 200 years later, he gets boring. He changes dramatically, okay? <laughs> he becomes... Uh, here's his costume developing into this fancy lad-looking thing here. Mm -hmm. You know, quite poncy tightly attard, not as demonic anymore, not as brutish as his original form here. Um, and he gets boring, really. And the routine gets old, you know. Meanwhile, Pedrolino kind of develops into something like this in France. This is Poirot. So his, his counterpart, the other servant, Pedrolino, is the clown developing into its form. Okay, so here's right. the clown in France. He was quite a sad clown, always crying and upset and feeling sorry for himself because... You know, um, while well, woe is me, why does Columbine love Harley Quinn instead of me? You know, <laughs> why does she want to run away with him when she could have me instead? I would treat her so much better. He was that kind of guy. You know, it's just just get over yourself type of clown, you know, <laughs> that type of guy. Right, right, right. Um, anyway, in Britain, clown was very different. Clown was wild and wacky and funny. Still dressed like this, though, like Pedrolino here in plain white clothing. OK, but he was a lot more of a wild card character and started to act a lot more like Harlequin did. He became more okay. demonic and witty and edgy and weird. You know, Harlequin became a bit more fancy and, and, and elo eloquent and cool and collect, you know. So mm -hmm. Clown kind of took over Harlequin as the demon role and his costume changed at the same time around this around this time period. So the French clown was doing its sad thing, still dressed in white garbs, you know, looking sad and sorry for itself like this, you know. But in, yeah. Brit in Britain, suddenly, out of nowhere, let's see if I can find a decent photo of it here. Um, he started to look something like this monster you see here on the left. Right. Just suddenly, a costume change happened. So there's Columbine with Harlequin running away and there's Pantaloon, the rich man and his other servant, Pedrolino. You know, it's it's the same routine. But why would you suddenly change the costume of the clown, which has been the same for a thousand years, by the way? He's always looked like this to suddenly dressing in this thing. Where does that come from? Like it's and it's never explained anywhere why this sudden change happened. All we get yeah. told is that um, this famous freemason charles dibdin he had a son called charles dibdin okay who basically took over the theater of the day which had this famous actor called joseph grimaldi okay and he was just a really brilliant clown he was just hilarious people loved him and he he gave grimaldi his first chance and saw how incredible he was as an actor and then he, he introduced during these early shows a brand new costume. And it said, oh, you know, I did it to make my mark on the industry. So people would recognize the Dibdin 
era of of writing plays for Sadler's Wells. He's the one who brought in this new form of artistry through the clown costume, you know. But Joseph Grimaldi is always given credit anywhere you look for the clown costume. He's given the credit. It's like Joseph Grimaldi created the modern clown costume. Anywhere you look for that, he will be equated as the guy who did it. When he didn't create the clown costume, it was the son of this guy who did it. You know, mm-hmm. Charles Dibdin. Mm-hmm. Now, Charles Dibdin Sr. here, prominent Freemason. Okay, he was a member of the Leicestershire Lodge. Um, he was a famous playwright, songwriter, musician, basically a media mogul of the music industry of the day. Okay, he was well established with the British Navy. His songs were sung by the sailors who were colon- out there colonizing everywhere. You know, he was given awards for keeping the mor- the morale of the British Navy up during with his music. He was like a famous. You would say, you would say he's the ditty of his day, would you? Oh yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> uh, even today, his music is still sung at the end of an orchestral um, yearly show called the Proms. They close. Oh, wow. okay. They close with his song, which is Tom Bowling which is um, was named that after his brother who died colonizing India. Okay, um, He was a member of the East India Company, which was like a, a company so loosely associated with the British Navy, but was out there actually just colonizing India for its for its resources. Right. Um, anyway, this 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 guy, you know, this is what the show started to look like in Britain. Nuts. It just got insane. OK, and this is kind of what it used to look like. And then it started looking like this. Big change in costume, massive change, you know, completely out there. Uh, and he's never explained where he got his inspiration from, but I just told you there, India. His yeah. family was heavily involved with India. His brother died out there, you know, so his uncle died out there. You know? And I do believe they brought Indian demonic iconography back to England with them. And they then dressed the clown in Indian-inspired demon clothing. Okay, and to prove this, I bring the receipts. Here's Joseph Grimaldi being painted in the original costumes he was made to wear in a very strange position. It's, I- it's identical to the Kalasung Sang Rakshasa demons of Bali. <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. in the same costume. All right, it's 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 yeah. it is the same costume. That's where they got their inspiration for it from. They modeled the clown after the Indian version. Of demons of Nephilim. For people that just want to say, "Oh, we, he was just in India," that's not necessarily. You got to think at a time where there's no television, there's no the, the source of entertainment for these men that are colonizing another area is going to be finding out everything about these people's culture, finding out what they can take, what they can, you know, uh, uh, yeah. what's the word appropriate to to use to to on their own. Of course, they're going to find this fascinating. Absolutely, and say, "Hey." We can we can use this. We can we can make some scratch off this. <laughs> yeah. And it was from that day on, you know, the that costume became the industry standard for clowns All clowns be- followed this this pattern. You know, the, this was it. This is how you dress now. If you want to be a clown in your show, in your region, you model That's after crazy. Joseph Grimaldi's clown, after Dibdin's clown. Um, and it's quite literally modeled after the Rakshas demons of India. Like it's absolutely that, that's where they got it, and and I can prove this even further. I haven't got the photo here, but I will just go on and just to show this, it's Thailand, fractious a temple, and if you look at images of these specific demons here, which are on the temple, um, can you see this one? Maybe I can oh, get it bigger. Oh, oh yeah. Ooh, sorry, I oh the, the trying to get used to please? a Mac here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh good. Yeah, so there you go. I mean that's. The same oh, costume, yeah. you just saw him, the, the same dots. position. Yeah, so that is, if I can bring it back up, that costume. Absolutely. It's the same. Absolutely. It's the same thing. And there's the Rakshasas holding up the temples of Thailand. You know, and that's a clown. That's where we get a clown from. It's modeled after these things, which are India's versions of cannibalistic giant hybrid snake human monsters, which are Nephilim. So the Nephilim look and, like clowns. Yeah, there you go. And now the uh, amazing, amazing theory. And now now the correlation between them and Freemasons, because, yes. you know, that's one thing for them to take it on the road show, whatever. And, and, you know, see, go to India, get inspired by this thing. That's a demon, AKA a Nephilim and come back and say, Hey, we can make a cool costume out of these freaky things. Look how many people, 
go to India. You can use that as an excuse and just say they went about their business mm -hmm. and maybe it inspired so many. But then when you add the Freemasonry in it, it seems that it gets a little more... Um... It was deeper than that. Absolutely yeah. deeper than that, yes. yeah. So um, if you look at, after this tradition of British theatre, um, there was an expansionist movement happening in America, independence of America and spreading out through the land, you know. Um, circuses and the tradition british traditions of the clown did go over to america but it took a long while for them to kind of get established it took till about the mid 1800s um early 1900s for circuses to get into the full swing you know but they did definitely mm -hmm. come from british tradition of these theater shows but you couldn't really put theaters on in america they kept burning down first of all i don't know why but most of the early th uh, circus theaters of america just burnt down really quick and you'll find the people running the circuses in America were more like businessmen rather than established theatre runners. They were more like con artists and in it for the money, investment bankers right. type people, you know. And uh, a lot of money was involved in early entertainment for America, as it always has been, because you use entertainment to keep the masses in line, you know. So travelling circuses were big money, and they were the way that they kept people busy and distracted. It was the early bread and circus of the Rome. It's just a modern version. But if you find the development of early circuses in America specifically, um, because they weren't stationary, they had the tent, the big top tent, you know, and it would go on the new railway systems that were being built at the time as well. And a lot of these new innovations were being made and so they could travel all across America and put on huge traveling circus shows. And you'll find all of the circuses of America were all run by Freemasons, every last one of them. Um, and they always call themselves brothers, like the Ringling Bros or the Robinson Bros or whatever, you know, but, but bro is what you give yourself as a title. If you're a member of the Brotherhood of Freemasonry, you are a brother. You are Brother Thompson or something, or your Brother Dibdin. You are a brother if you're a member of the craft. So that's what they were hinting at with all these names, first of all. Right. But anyway, during this, this, this period of time, the late 1800s, they all joined together, 10 of them, all Freemason run to put on one giant traveling spectacular. And it was called, it, we're talking like a thousand man army here of actors and troops and performers, you know, all run by these Freemason orchestras of the rituals, you know. And mm -hmm. it was called King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Now, if I can get this up, actually, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba Circus. And here's the posters that were knocking about at the time. Um... And it was trying to recreate Solomon's court in all its spectacular glory, you know. And here's a newspaper clipping of the time. Um, and it shows here, you know, 10 truly great shows merged into one. Huge, three big circus rings, three menageries of animals, grand biblical spectacle, complete aviary, gigantic musician. It was just, they were just going all out with this King Solomon story and you realize that's because right. the freemasons are obsessed with solomon they love that guy he is like the 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 bro the idol they they want to be him because mm -hmm. um you know freemasonry solomon's temple they're all about rebuilding solomon's temple it's what all the symbolism is re equating to they believe the two in pillars. wisdom and all that stuff yeah, yeah, and all the all the esoteric. He was the keeper of all the knowledge and all these type of things. He had the ring, right. which controlled the demons to build his temple. Okay, he was he was the ringmaster. Solomon is the ring leader. Okay, he is the guy yeah. with the power of the ring to control the lord ritual the and the demons. He's the lord of the ring. Yes, and a lot of people don't realize this, but um, Freemason, worshipful. Grand Master. The worshipful Grand Master of any lodge is the only one allowed to wear a black top hat or a hat of any kind. Okay, it's, it's regional, it changes slightly. Right. But nobody else is allowed to wear that top hat other than the leader of the lodge. And the why? It represents the crown mm -hmm. of Solomon. Okay, only the king can wear a crown, it's symbolic. Okay, and then you realize that all these Freemasons run all these circuses, and then you have the ring master of a circus he is just a worshipful grand master hmm. of a lodge he's an analogy of the of the leader of a lodge he's the same thing he is king solomon right okay so the ring leader the lord of the ring is king solomon hmm. of a circus and what does king solomon control to build his temple with the ring demons hmm. what are the main components of a ring leader and what does he control he controls clowns it's just a metaphor 
for lodge rituals and King Solomon analogs. All these right. early circuses were quite literally Freemason rituals, which were normally done in a small lodge, just on a really, really grand scale with the public paying for it to come and see it. And the public don't know what they're coming to see, but the initiated will go to these things and say, this is incredible. I normally see these rituals done on a tiny scale in my crappy little lodge in my backwater town. But here yeah. I'm looking at this grand, enormous version of my ritual, just done on a huge scale. You know, it's spectacular. It's amazing. And that's what they were. That's Make no mistake, all circuses were fully formed and, and utilized by Freemasons from the very beginning. All Shriners today still control the biggest traveling circus in, in America. Okay, and th wow. it's, it's a, it's a, the Ringling Brothers were all Freemasons, and the Sarasota Ringling Circus that's still around today, it's a Freemason-based organization from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they really took the clown on and adopted it and formed it to be more of the classic clown we see today. Okay, so they kept they kept mm -hmm. sculpting and molding the image of a clown, and if you look at um, early clown posters, uh, if you get some good examples here. Um, they really lean into the giant iconography quite a lot. They always represent them as giants. Look at this one. This is quite literally a... Can you see this one here? Oh, uh, yeah. It's quite yeah. literally a giant looming over everything, picking up a giraffe, you know? <laughs> they are they're showing in tongue-in-cheek form the truth on the matter, you know? And, and so, they know so are they like like the ancestor worship kind of thing? Or, or is it the goal or has this even being found out that the goal of freemasonry is to try to control demons like solomon did to create something or to build something or to, to they, give them they, more power they communicate with demons for power and also well, you know secret societies are just the modern day versions of these serpent worship cults of the past they've always been in communication with these entities from the very beginning Freemasons and secret societies are kind of like the physical foot soldiers, and they answer to the spiritual foot soldiers of the angels, which are the Nephilim. So they take mm -hmm. orders from the Nephilim. The Nephilim spirits take orders from their parents, which are the angels. It's like a hierarchy here, you know. And in order to create stronger channels and communicate with them more easily, they've created their own version of an ancestor spirit channeling costume, and they called it a clown but they made it public. They made it out in the open. It's hidden in plain sight. It's mm -hmm. And th this is where exoteric and esoteric comes into play. Now, it's an exoteric image. So exoterically, the public just see it as a bit of fun for the kids. Right. Esoterically, the hidden meaning, which the initiated will know, is it's a costume used as a tool to channel demons. So publicly, it's fun right. for the kids. Secretly, it's tool used to channel demons. Do you get what I mean? That's how the occult works. That's the practices mm -hmm. they are at play here. And uh, like I said, they're, they're, they've been hinting at this since the very beginning. Here it is with its tongue sticking out, just like the Rakshas are demons. You know, it's the same thing. And I actually have a, a thumbnail I made that perfectly encapsulates this, actually, which I think I'm just going to have to show you just to really drive home this point. Um, and while I'm explaining this as well, the Three Ring Circus was actually created by someone called Barnum, uh, P.T. Barnum, Phineas Barnum. And he was mm -hmm. a member of the Odd Fellows, and the Odd Fellows logo is three interlocking rings. So he incorporated that into the circus as well. Wow. It's all Freemason iconography. But if I go to thumbnails here, let's just go to my my series clown series, and where is it? Where is it? Of course, they're not in any order. I need them to be in right now. Uh, <laughs> and it. here they are, all side by side. Once it comes up, uh, showing. Here's the dragons of China. Right. Here's the Rakshasas of India. Here's the clown from those early circuses. They they just copied these beasts and made their own version of it. <laughs> okay, that's all it is. And the game now is to get as many channels open as possible. So they're actually encouraging more and more people and members of the public to dress like clowns. And they do that through... Um, constantly cycling through new versions of the joker or recycling it for example every so yeah. often so that every halloween there's more costumes that people can wear and channel more of these demons unknowingly being ignorant of the law does not make you immune to this law unfortunately and right. and optimally a demon wants to possess you without you even realizing it that's the best way to do it they don't want you to know that's what you've done okay because if you know you can cast them out 
<laughs> like so it's best to stay right. hidden especially in the west which is a highly christianized nation they're not so hidden in all these other countries because they're not christian they're not worried about being cast out in the name of jesus or mm. anything like that so they're quite open and brash but in the west it's sneakier it's more hidden it's in the shadows you're not supposed to know what's going on you know what i mean that's that's the game at play here so yeah I don't know if I can make it any more clear what's going on here, but wherever you see um, cultures and movements happen, like, for example, 2023, clown fashion was the highest trending thing. Um, right. Clown core, clown core fashion. Clown core, yeah. I've heard it. Um, and you see a lot of TikTokers out there um, wearing this new aesthetic, as they call it, you know, and popularizing it among the youth right. as, a, as a legitimate way to dress in day-to-day -day basis walking around down the streets perfectly normal you know get the clown core aesthetic now you know go buy all these things and you're good to go for the day uh, but this is obviously inspired by real legitimate catwalks and runaways clown core fashion trend of 2023 right. actual models are walking down catwalks promoting this concept this fashion style this dress and then eventually this extreme form trickles down into a more watered down version in the outlets, which we buy our normal clothes from that we have to wear. They're getting more and more people to dress this way and accept it as normal because it will open up more channels. More people are dressing just like these ancient cultures have been doing for thousands of years to purposely get in touch with their own ancestor spirits. They're just opening up more and more channels for us to be possessed without us even realizing it. It's very subtle and very outrageous i know what it sounds like but uh spiritually speaking this all adds up this is yeah you know, yeah we, no. we have to be careful i i've, I've said this a couple times on the show for a variety of different reasons but i say people will will people will go to hell will people will ride to hell on a highway of cuteness and that means this these this type of aesthetic the oh it's cute it's just cute it's fun it's cute but you don't know where this is leading you really when you mm -hmm. see things like this, there's a darker, it always seems like there's some weird, dark, uh, maybe even sexual, fetishized, weird thing about it. Or oh, yeah. The, the sad cloud. There's always a weird depression or some type of dark cloud over this type of thing. And it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I see the reality behind the veil. I'll say that. I do. I see everything that you're saying. I, I can I can see it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I I, it's 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 right there in your face. It always has been, and anyone who like wants to argue, oh, the clown's just a harmless bit of fun. So get over it. I have quite literally just shown you that the origin of a Western clown costume is literally modeled after demons of India and Europe. It is there is no other way to yeah. interpret it. You're just applying your own cultural naivety on top of the image of a clown. It historically speaking, it is a representation of a demon like it it that is where it comes from there's no way around it unfortunately um so to dress like a thing is to channel the thing this is what all ancestor spirit culture worships know thoroughly like they know it thoroughly you know there's no yeah. like when this guy dresses this way he knows what he's doing yeah like he knows why he knows exactly why he's doing this i want the spirits to come into me Right. He will tell you that, you know. Same thing but when the, the Thayim... West were held ignorant to it. Yeah, when the Thayim do this, they know what they're doing. Yeah. Like, but when we do it, we're ignorant. We think it's just a bit of fun for the kids. We've been duped. Mm -hmm. We've been fooled. It, it's been normalized, you know. It, it's almost worse. I mean, I don't know which one's darker. To just accept it, the, that's their ancestor. They, they feel that's the ancestor. Or to not even know it. Mm. To just feel like this is just a, a normal societal uh, entertainment that we take pleasure in. I think it's worse to be naive to the whole thing, you know, in a way. Oh, my God. Because uh, we don't even know what we're up against. We're in a worse position because we don't even realize we've even been deceived to begin with. At least these ancestor spirit culture worship people, when they hear the gospel come and heard that Jesus cast out evil spirits, they can mm. have a context to understand exactly why that's important. Because right, they've been communicating right. with these demons openly for years. And it's like, it's wait a, a minute. Term. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. We, we can have power over them. They've yeah. never heard that before. It's, they're blown right. away by that concept, which is why it's so easy to convert people to Christianity in these right, places because right. they have dealt with these creatures openly in brutal forms, sacrificing to them for so long. Mm -hmm. It's a breath of fresh air when some culture comes along and says, no, 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 no. These things are weak and they are defeated and you can have authority over them. They're like, right. what? 
but we don't yeah. even believe a spirit realm exists. Yeah. <laughs> we don't even know, you know. And look at these right. look at these clown looking things in, in Australia. You know, these are the Wanginas, these are the offspring of the rainbow serpents. They are quite literally dressed like a clown. Right. Like this it's like where we get our clown from is modelled after these things. There's there's I cannot emphasize enough how important this is and how real this is. I mean, did you see earlier the demon face syndrome thing that was going around? Yes, where people people were seeing, are seeing this, right? They're seeing demon faces. Yeah, well, they look like clowns. <laughs> That's what yeah, they're seeing, wide-eyed yeah. wide features. This is what they're beginning to see, you know, when you see the demon within people. I'm not saying people are demons with a mask right. on. I think right. you're seeing the demon in people that's trying to control yeah. them. And you see right. it manifest through their features, you know, and that's where you get these things from. I, I, I mean, I, I have thousands of images here, you know, <laughs> that I've showcased on my channel way better yeah. than I have done today, you know. But it's, it, I'm not just making this up. I think a lot of people don't really, they think I'm just saying stuff for clout or something, or I'm just, I'm trolling in some way. I'm deadly serious. Like, they, these are AI images, all right, but the Nephilim looks something like this. Okay. Yeah. That's Jeez. a that's a human dragon hybrid with white pale skin, psychedelic patterns and features, fiery wild red hair, glowing blue wild eyes, sharp serpentine teeth with human pink lips. This is what you get when you mash those things together. It's terrifying. Okay, this is what the, this is venom, isn't it? From the uh, Spider-Man universe, you know? Right, right. It's it's the same thing, you know, and every culture would have their own artistic way of depicting it. Here's a Japanese-inspired AI rendition, you know? <laughs> but they would all have their own way of doing it, and every culture down the line has maintained this. But then in the music industry, here's, here's uh, yep, uh... Bono utilizing the same tactic and trick. He's not just doing this because he's a bit weird. He's doing something that has been done for thousands of years. Okay, he's doing the same thing. He is channeling just as much as this guy is right here with his red nose. You know, it's it's the same process. It's it, and it's it's so nefarious. I mean, look at these Wangina looking things. This is yeah. this has no business being in a random remote rock art cave in the middle of the Kimberley region of the deserts of Australia. Okay. And this is thousands of years ago. Is this the Oh, th yeah, these things are uh, these things are painted onto caves um in the Kimberley regions and they've been repainted every year by a shaman who and only a shaman is allowed to do it every year to keep them fresh. Wow. Um and I'm trying to find a really good example because I know there's, there's there's loads of examples of these. Um but I know I've got one where I've put the side by side with a clown and it's just uncanny like the difference. Oh, first of all, here's Medusa by the way. Again, it's not a snake head green red woman. hair. It's a red head, white skin, tongue sticking out, Rakshasa. But this is in That's Greece. Crazy. This crazy. is in Greece, you know. And the story of how this thing got made: a chidna, which is a human turned into a siren, a snake woman. So mm -hmm. a woman who's been hybridized, or a human woman who's been changed, having sex with a sea god. Who's an who's a fallen angel? <laughs> okay, and that's wow. where we call Typhon, and that's where we get Gorgons from, which are these Nephilim creatures, which are human, and they don't look like snake people. They had arms and legs like this on pottery. Okay, they 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 look like clowns, and you saw the one that was on Athena's chest earlier, uh, quite literally a clown, you know. Uh, but even on the Aztec calendar, right in the center, you have the tongue sticking out thing. Have you ever heard of uh, this? Is might be there's a thing called Ahiago face. Now I don't necessarily think you should search it right now while you have the thing up, but because it's very uh, it's sexual in nature, and I think maybe porn categories use may use it. But the tongue but sticking out. It, it's a girl's sticking out their tongue while crossing their eyes. I believe it's Japanese, yeah, yeah inspired yeah. or something, but. It, it's become a thing. They stick their tongue out and they roll their eyes when they're like at uh, they could be at, you know, a concert or something. You know, a lot of people with kiss used to do the stick out the tongue thing back in the day. But yeah, it's it, it's become a very weird like, why are y'all doing this? What is what is it, it's that type of face. 
it's, yeah. it literally is yeah well there's a famous uh, saying in the bible um and it's that you're saying to whom do you stick out your tongue like why are you doing this basically like what there spirits is. what spirits working through you to make you do this you know and when yeah, people yeah. just involuntarily stick their tongue out you have to wonder if it's these spirits working through them. So here's Medusa, a giant holding a horse in her arms with wings and arms like a human, but with this dragon face. You know, and um, that's again, that's the Gorgons of Greece, but that's a Rakshasa of India. It's the same, it's the exact same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's the same creature. They all dealt with the Nephilim, no matter where you went in some way. And every culture just has their own artistic way of depicting them, their own unique style you know he's some elongated skulls by the way which i was talking about earlier that were found um yes and they were very they were very psychedelically colorful weird looking creatures you know um and let me just let me find i've got to show you this i just have to show you this comparison um for the one gina because it's just uncanny uh sorry this is just uh going back to sri lanka again one of the one of the versions <laughs> it's just another clown isn't it by that standard yeah. um kind of has the wild man feature a little bit yeah yeah well you find that they kind of blend as you go across the lands right, of right. the of the earth some of them are hairy some of them are not i can think there was wild variation i do really do think on that one where, go down a little bit the ronald mcdonald and the wajin or the there it is yeah there we go so there's the wanjina yeah, on a rock yeah. art painting in kimberley and there's that a is just, i mean <laughs> And, and when you think of the things that do this, right, like, and for instance, McDonald's, you know, like they, they this type of I, the food's bad for you. I mean, that's what we know it as here. I mean, the food is not good for you. It's poisoning you possibly. Right. Absolutely. It, it, the, the movie It is meant to scare you to death about, you know, they're eating children or whatever. Uh, it, it usually always ties back to some dark darkness behind it. And uh, it's very weird. Very weird, man. Um. Mm. Paul, man, you 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 really showed up today, man. I really appreciate it. I've been following you for a while over at your channel, uh, Understanding Conspiracy, and uh, you have amazing videos. And y'all that that are watching here today, if you if you haven't checked out his channel, please do. Understanding Conspiracies. You have a book coming out on this, which I'm happy to hear, man. This is a lot of information, great information yeah. that you put together. Uh, what can when is it coming out? What, what's up with that? um yeah so the book is in two parts because it's a lot of information like you said yeah. uh, the first book is called the history and it's okay. everything i've explained as where the nephilim come from all the rebellion i talked about you know and and the intricacies of the back and forth that happened there that could have resulted in the nephilim gaining their features and um also wow. how how did they survive the flood exactly it talks about the flood and what happened during that it talks about the hybridization of humans just before the flood which we didn't even touch on today but as a whole other thing um, yeah, and then yeah. it goes on to explain the whole history of Freemasonry, of clowning, and where we get the costumes from, as I showed you briefly here, but I just go into more detail and give the give the dates and the times and all the quotes right. from the memoirs and all those type of things. It's all in the book there. Um, mm -hmm. And then after that, I've talked about that specific history, and I give a full breakdown of the clown as a caricature and explain why each feature of a clown is specifically a reference to Nephilim features. Uh, for example, here you can see behind me there's a... Um, a slit just below the pupil of that clown and mm -hmm. uh, that's a predator feature predators have slit pupils um wow. and the nephilim likely had that from their reptilian fathers too so it's kind of it's, it's stuff like all little stuff like that you know i flesh it out and i give the details um and then after those chapters are finished i do a full study on clown societies and how the, there are plenty of practices out there that still today dress this way to channel spirits and that's a precursor to section two because the book two is going to be all about these cultures I've shown you, breaking each culture down. Okay, so that's book two. That's called going to be called the now, which is all okay. the modern stuff. So book one, which is about to be published, finishes with DMT jesters, people on psychedelics okay. communicating with these spirits, and they look like jesters and all that sort of stuff. And once that's boxed off, that's the basis set for the whole theory. And then book two, which will be published in a year's time, which will be combined together into one book once they're both finished as well. Uh, so you can buy that too. But um, that'll all be about the cultures and all the different individual cultures and the way they dress. And then section two of the second book will be about film industry, music industry, the clown serial killers and murderers, all these type of things, the fear of clowns, you know, mo real modern manifestations in the West, that sort right. of thing. And that'll be the two books done. But uh, the first volume is going to be published in two months. Yeah, so it's exciting. Stuff. Nice. Congratulations, man.
Uh, I'm definitely going to be ordering the book, both books, the omnibus, all of it. Um, I'm I'm down and and uh, I think a lot of people are going to be interested in this, if, if especially if you're listening, if you're trying to listen, because I'm a person that was never, I don't want to say never. I grew up in the church, okay, when I was younger or whatever, and then you know as you get older, you go to school, you you start thinking more independently, uh, you, you know, you start thinking about different things, kind of get away for where you stop believing in. Like I had an argument with a girlfriend one time, an ex of mine saying she said she didn't really believe in God. And that threw me back one time. And I and I was like, huh, how do you not believe in God? And, and I was like, uh, she said she believes in ghosts. I was like, wait, you believe in ghosts, but you don't believe in God. And and I was like, I don't believe in ghosts, really, but I believe in God. You know what I mean? And and that there was a, I had to ask myself, well, wait a minute. If I'm only looking at, especially for my show or whatever, conspiracies of you know, science of, of the, the aliens are landing here or AI or all this other stuff. There has to be something to the spiritual realm too. It's not like, I mean, if, if we're looking for truth, we have to be able to go back and see what the people furthest back, cl closer to the time of creation we're saying. And the closest thing we have to that is the Bible. We have these other things and a lot of uh, cultural, uh, you know, uh, theology, histories, have similar attributes. Everyone says the flood happens. Mm -hmm. Everyone, you know, talks about, uh, you know, they, especially if you're part of the Judeo Christian, you know, that, that side of the Abrahamic religions, we all share similarities and it's telling us in these texts that things happen before us that might explain UFOs, cults, you know, all these different things that, you know, I, I think we need to take a deeper dive into it. And you're doing that, and uh, that makes me excited, man. So uh, I appreciate you, Paul. Thank you, man. Do you have any last words you want to say? Or no, uh, if anyone wants to find more, there's a whole series on my channel, Understanding Conspiracy. Just click on playlists. Click on Nothing Look Like Clowns. 43 episodes there. Go into my live shows, and I've talked about these things on many podcasts in many details, and I have loads of extra stuff on my channel about this. Again, you can always just go to the book once published in a couple of months' time as well and keep track of that. Uh, but, you know, I, I want people to realize I, I talk about plenty of other things on my channel. I think you're aware of that. Yeah. I'm, I'm a yep. scattershot conspiracy theorist at heart. This just happens to be a particular niche I'm focusing on right now that I've kind of uncovered. Um, but I, I, I'm first and foremost a Christian contrarian conspiracy theorist. That's what I am. You're right. Um, and, you know, my message fundamentally might be a scary one for a lot of people. But what I'm actually trying to say is, you know, these are a defeated enemy and we have authority over them in Christ. Um, it's a know your enemy situation. That's why I'm doing this. You need to know what they look like. You need to understand it when you recognize it, when you can see right. it. And I have solutions and it's getting to know Jesus Christ and taking your power in his authority over these things. Um, I, I don't think there's a single human being alive who has not had a demonic encounter. They just may not right. talk about it. They may mm -hmm. keep it suppressed. We've all dealt with these things and all will continue to deal with these things. And um, there are solutions. So my channel offers those solutions. Come check it out. Uh, thanks for having me. I, re I really appreciate this. I really do. Awesome. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, have you back to talk about Millennial uh, Kingdom, too, <laughs> for another time. Let's get Maybe. into it. Bro. Maybe. Sure thing. <laughs> sure thing. All right, brother. Take care. You too. Bye now. All right. Bye. Recording.